getting us started. It is, it is 7.06 and we are back in regular session. All trustees are, are present. And at this time, the Grapevine Colleyville Independent School District Board of Trustees and Central Administration will pause for a moment of silence to reflect on the, the continued successes of our district, the safety and well being of our students, our dedicated teachers and staff, and our supportive community. Thank y'all very much. Now, at this time, we will have our US and Texas pledges and tonight we are honored to have students from Silver Lake Elementary School and they're going to join us and lead the pledges. They will proudly represent their school by leading the pledge and U US pledge and followed by the Texas pledge. And then they'll share their thoughts on how they are progressing towards the portrait of a graduate. Leading the US and Texas pledges is our sec is a second grader, Sophia Urena. Do we have Sophia with us tonight? I see her name. After the pledges, Silver Lake will begin their portrait of a graduate presentation. Sophia, you can get us started whenever you are ready. Sophia, can you hear me, hon? Can you hear me? You, you're, you are um, muted on your side, honey. Can you un can you unmute yourself? Sophia, you want to try speaking again? Let's see if we can hear you. No. I was going to, does Ellie or Keegan, do either one of you have the pledges there with you that you could lead us? Need to <laughs> again? <laughs> Not to put y'all on a spot. No, that's, o that's okay. That's okay, Keegan and Ellie. That's fine. We will just. Sophia, if you will just go ahead and say it and we will follow along with you. Okay, hon? You want to go ahead and start? Just go ahead and start and we can see you.
Okay. Um, Ellie, we can hear you now. Okay. The host has to unmute, uh, unmute me. It won't let me. So we can hear you. So you're good. You're good. Thank you for that. Was a very uh, clever way of letting us know what was going on. Um, so you go ahead with your presentation, hun. All right. Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm a fifth grader and I love to relate. Let me tell you why. In dual language, English speakers help Spanish speakers, and Spanish speakers help English speakers. Sometimes if I don't know a word in Spanish, I will ask my partner for help. When I was younger, I, I relied on my partner more because I didn't know as much Spanish as I know now. I am proud of myself and my teachers for helping me be able to understand, read, and even speak Spanish. I'm really glad I got to be a part of the dual language program. It has helped me be able to communicate in two languages. That's just fun. At Silver Lake, we are also an experienced design school. Some of my favorite experiences are Shrek the Musical, Learning, Experience the Arts, the Chocolate Experience, the Camping Experience, and Winter Wonderland. I performed in front of two live audiences in Shrek. It is an experience I will never forget because I got to sing solos, dance, and pretend I was Princess Fiona. Because of my time at Silver Lake, I'm comfortable speaking in front of people. I feel like Silver Lake has made me a more independent learner. My teachers display anchor charts around the room. I used to need help for math, but now I can use the anchor charts to help me remember what I have already been taught. I don't have to ask my teacher for help anymore. The anchor charts also help me so that I can understand when my teachers teach in Spanish. As you can see, Silver Lake is a fun place that prepares the kids to, to be global citizens, collaborative learners, effective communicators, and self-regulated learners. Thank you for allowing me to speak about how awesome Silver Lake is. Gracias y que tengas una buena noche. Say my speech. Yes, Keegan, go ahead, hon. Hi, I'm Keegan, and I'm going to tell you why Silver Lake is the best. Being in a dual language program has prepared me for a future career because say I were to grow up and be a doctor or a dentist and somebody walks in and only speaks Spanish. Instead of having to get somebody to translate, I could just talk to them myself. Um, I could also get a job in Nicaragua, Peru or Mexico. The dual language program has even inspired me to, to learn German or French. Dual language has given me more opportunities for the future. The dual language program has made me a better citizen through my amazing teachers who are good influences. That persuades me to be nicer, loving, and more caring for others. I can be a collaborative learner if my friend needs help and we are in Spanish class. I could help him or her because I could understand the words, or vice versa. I could be an effective communicator for example, one time my friend's mom called and she only spoke Spanish. She was wondering if there was baseball practice on Thursday and I had to translate to my dad what she had said. That's why Silver Lake is an awesome school. It's prepared me to be a global citizen, work well with others, and be a good communicator. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're having the same problem, Rodrigo, that we're not able to hear you. I'm so sorry. No, I know. <laughs> Always. <laughs> we are not. Is there anything we can do on Arian, Kyle? We just need to. Okay.
Rodrigo, can you try again for us? No. I'm so sorry. There we go. No. Okay. I think. Hmm. Hey, can, try. Can, can you, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yay. You can Rodrigo? hear me? Yes, so go ahead. Okay. My mom's going to turn on the camera. Okay. Thank you for being patient with us. You're welcome. Now we can see you and we can hear you. So go ahead with your presentation. Hi, my name is Rodrigo Urana Classe. I am a student at Silver Lake Elementary and I am in second grade. I love my school because it is an experience design school. In our last experience, we had about the arts. I got to listen to a lot of members in our community. My favorite one was the musician. He got me thinking that maybe when I grow up, I want to do something with music. Like I am able, I like that I am able to connect with people out of, outside of my school. Also, the dual language has helped to learn, help me learn Spanish because I know Spanish, I will be able to communicate with people from 20 different countries in the world. That is very exciting. Thank you for inviting me and I hope you can see Silver Lake is the best school. Very good job. Now, Rodrigo, is your sister right there with you? Is Sophia with you? Yes. Can she come back onto camera with you? Sure. So she can do the pledges? Well, we've, we've done the pledges, but I wanted to thank Sophia. Thank you so much for being patient with us. And we did the pledges right here. We could read your lips. Mm -hmm. So you did a you did a good job leading us. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, we want to, and so uh, Sophia and Rodrigo, they're both second graders. And then Ellie is a fifth grader. And Keegan is also a fifth grader. So we'd like to thank you all for being with us tonight. And Miss Whiteside is our Silver Lake um, Elementary principal. And thank you, ma'am, for being with us. Is there anyone else you know that's logged on tonight that you'd like to um, recognize or introduce? I just want to thank all the students and, and um, parents for helping us put together this night. We really were excited to share all the learning that happens at Silver Lake. Thank you very much. And thank you all, all again. You did a great job. And we can tell that how much you love Silver Lake Elementary. So thank you all for joining us tonight. At this time, we will, I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Ryan for an introduction of uh, recognitions this evening. Dr. Ryan. Yes, thank you, uh, President Fardo. So as we continue to use our strategic plan, uh, LEAD 2.0, uh, to guide our work in GCISD, we always highlight uh, at this point of the meeting a, a different aspect of the district uh, uh, to show our trustees and to show our community uh, the work that we're doing at, with LEAD 2.0 and how those goals uh, impact our students. This month, we're going to highlight the positive impact that our instructional technology team has made uh, with its Canvas Academy. And so um, I'll introduce Janie Statch. I see Janie there. She's our coordinator of instructional technology. Uh, Janie, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. It's an honor to introduce Carson and Ashley this evening. The work they are about to present speaks to the value of the collaboration happening between instructional technology and campus leadership. This work exemplifies our values of purpose, innovation, and community, and it is an example of leading from where you are. Ashley White is the learning liaison at Colleyville Heritage High School, and Carson Jackson is an instructional technology coach who works very closely with our high schools. So I'm going to hand it over to them. 
So I'm going to interrupt right quick. Um, I was at Call of Heritage and I was in the hallway and Ashley um, came out into the hallway and she approached me and she said, uh, do you have three minutes? Well, <laughs> I didn't have three minutes. <laughs> I was already late and I was behind. But how many times does Ashley White come ask me for three minutes? Never. So I said, I, be I better go in and see this. And so uh, I uh, went into uh, her office and she showed me the work that she and Carson had been doing with our with our teachers uh, with Canvas. Uh, and it was just amazing. And three minutes turned into about 20 and I just loved every minute of it. So uh, I said, uh, we've got to we've got to hear uh, about this because um, a good work is happening. And we we were better in September than we were in August. We were better in October than we were in September and we're better in November than we were in October. And it's because of the leadership of uh, all of our teachers, but uh, but also people like Ashley and Carson and Janie uh, and the work that they do every single day to just help people learn a little bit more about this work. This is the first time in the history of the world that we've ever had to do something like this. And so it's just taken us a while, but they're doing <laughs> outstanding work. Now you can go, Ashley. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Ryan. And uh, thank you, Dr. Schnauz, Dr. Gorman, Dr. Grobel, and, and Janie Statch for believing and supporting Carson in, uh, and I in this um, Endeavor Canvas Academy is a professional learning course that Carson and I have co-created and it's to, to support our work in GCISD with goal one, uh, removing uh, actively identifying and removing barriers that limit access to an opportunity for learning. Um, we believe Canvas Academy is is rooted in um, research and it has a very thorough implementation planning process that we hope to highlight for you. And so here we go. Um, last spring, uh, almost every piece of feedback that we had, at least of my campus, Colleyville Heritage, was um, highlighting a very real need that we have and that the students wanted and needed a consistent method for accessing their materials and their course content. And what hap what ended up happening is, is when we have a district who's been one to one for so long and you have a lot of just professional educators who take control of their own learning just on my campus alone there were 10 different ways that teachers were getting the curriculum to their students and it started to provide like a prevail of provide it started to be a barrier to some students learning because they just were getting confused between the 10 different ways that their teachers could have been organizing the information. Uh, so what this means is um, GCISD decided to make the courageous decision to implement Canvas 6th through 12th grade. And then ever since then, we have been working to remove those barriers for all 7,000 or more than 7,000 of our secondary students. Let's see. Um, so the purpose of Canvas Academy is to improve the clarity, the consistent expectations for student engagement and learning by creating a, a consistent design flow for accessing, completing, and submitting their work through modules for all secondary students. And we believe that once um, where a Canvas Academy accomplishes this, we will be able to achieve this vision of creating a sustainable curriculum that is just further refined with each passing year for our 600 educators and the over 1,000 courses that they teach. To give you a little bit of background on our Canvas implementation and professional learning history, um, this is a timeline that represents where we were summer of 2020 all the way until where we are now. So um, we started with Growing with Canvas and Growing with Canvas was an implementation course developed by Canvas that they handed us and they said, this is what we have for you guys um, and this is going to prepare your teachers. Um, and it did what it needed to do for the summer of 2020 and all of our secondary teachers went through Growing with Canvas um, and that was their professional learning for this summer, but it was not GCISD-ified as we like to say. It didn't target those specific needs that we know our GCISD teachers um, need to have in order to be successful in Canvas. So we developed the Canvas First Day Ready course, which was um, equipping our teachers with the necessary skills that they needed to walk into a classroom on the first day of having remote uh, learners and face-to-face -face learners and being prepared. Um, as we know, we learned and grew and refined, and here we are now with our Canvas Academy. 
Um, our, our first why for Canvas Academy is to lessen the gap between teachers and their instructional technology knowledge and skills. So um, my team specifically, we do um, instructional technology walks all around the district to see where student or where teachers are using technology and we use something called SAMR um, as you can see in that graphic um, and what we know is teachers are doing amazing things but we don't have um, one strong foundation that we as GCSD have rolled out to equip them in strong foundational skills we have strong foundational skills don't get me wrong uh, but we have teachers that are um, at all different levels and so we use SAMR to identify that um, and we know that that's our why number one for Canvas Academy and we're going to get into a little bit more of that in a second. Um, our why number two is that our teachers need to have 100% of our teachers need to have a strong foundation in Canvas to build upon so we can't have that um, enriched content. We can't have anything that we know our students need if our teachers don't have these strong foundational skills. Um, so that's why we are as a team and as a district are working to create uh, Canvas Academy. Our plan is to have these foundational practices and then build on um, these different levels as our teachers are ready to um, grow their expertise in Canvas. Uh so our, our third why is the one I think I guess I just get the most passionate about <laughs> is um, I want we wanted a way that we could inform our campus administration of this is what the teachers know and this is what how we can grow them. We wanted the same for our learning leaders and then for also Carson and I's work. So we are using the data from this um, campus academy that 130 of, of our teachers have gone through and we're, we're going to use it to they create and draft these very specific uh, learning plans to help all 100% of our teachers reach this goal so that next year we can add on to the, um, the foundation and just keep growing with it, but all together. The, um, in a minute, Carson will, will take you through the course and you'll be able to see all the hard work and time we've put in. But any course that you go to in Canvas, when you look on the left side, there is um, a, a part of it called a course navigation. And it's on the left side and it starts with home and it'll have syllabus and modules and announcements. And so the way we organized it is we just wrote every single one of them down and we started talking about if we could get all 130 teachers on our campus to have these things on the home page, how impactful would that be? And then what about their syllabus? And what about their modules? And so we did the foundational level first, and then as we were throwing around ideas and different features that Canvas had, we started to emerge these ones that would be best practice and exemplary practice. So it's kind of it's going to roll individually be three waves, um, three levels that that teachers will work through, and um, us helping 100% of teachers reach each level. Now what you guys have all been waiting for, uh, we want you guys to see the course. So as we are going to do a quick simulation of what the course looks like, but as we're going through the course, there are three things that we want you to look at. Look for visual cues um, and estimated time, those clear in instructions. Also look for our personality within the course to make it engaging for our teachers. Look for options of learning when possible um, and teacher examples. So you will see GCISD teachers modeling best practices in this course and it's absolutely amazing. Um, we also have clear directions and rubrics that give teachers that specific feedback that we ask our teachers to give students. So we built this course modeling what, our, what we want our teachers to be doing. So without further ado, we're gonna get into this course. So this is the homepage of our course. So welcome to Canvas Academy. This is what all of our teachers have seen. Um, we have our purpose and vision to just reinforce what we, what we, you know, the foundation of our learning for this course. Um, if you click on this level one button, it will take you directly to an overview page. So, um, so teachers enrolled in, as students in this course will have um, an overview of what the course will look like. Um, along with that, we have an emoji key of what, um, what it, they're expected to do. So, for example, a book means they need to read something. Um, a video means that they're, they need to watch something and there's teacher examples for them to watch and so on. Um, so over here, this is that navigation that Ashley was talking about. 
I'm going to click on modules here, and this is going to take us to um, these their first module. So um, right here we have even technology setup recommendations. So if there's any type of confusion of their expectations, we hopefully thought of that and we're able to um, take care of that here. So we are going to just walk through one of their tasks. We're not going to ask you to submit anything in Canvas Academy, don't worry. Um, but we just want you to see what it looks like for one task submission. So for example, this is in order to learn how to create a homepage um, and using navigation. The teachers have a two minute activity where they read. They also have resources down here. Um, and this is just setting those clear expectations. Next, we have um, a few options for teachers. So if they already have a homepage, we give them the option um, to, skip, to skip this step. Then they also have option two. And then this video um, is highlighting different teachers around the district that are utilizing homepages. The next page is um, a three minute activity. Um, and again, we're highlighting teacher examples and modeling clear directions of what um, they need to do in order to successfully complete this activity. The next page are teacher more teacher examples, um, and we've highlighted them here, and that's a video of Ashley walking through those teachers' courses and um, what's, making, what's making them successful and highlighting what they're doing correctly. And then this is their task submiss submission page. So here we have their requirements their directions and then links to anything that they need to help them successfully submit this assignment. Um, if we scroll down, here's a clear rubric that walks them through exactly what they need to do to get the amount of points that they're willing to earn. The neat thing about this is on our end, when we're grading this work, we can quickly go through these rubrics and this is what we ask our teachers to do, but we can also give them specific feedback and comments. So if it's not something, um, maybe they just need to refine what they're doing or make it even better, this is a great opportunity for us to give them those comments. Um, once they do that, they'll submit it and that we have 11 tasks for them to go through um, in order to successfully earn their level one um, Canvas Academy badge. So everyone sees this amazing gift of Dr. Ryan at the end of each level. Um, and that's just a quick highlight of the course. I hate technology. <laughs> that is one of my most favorite pages in the entire course, Dr. Ryan. I can just imagine how it's gonna spread like wildfire and how many more people will earn their badge sooner so they can see your gift again <laughs> uh, so here the the last parts of this is just some teacher feedback and voice so after everything we do at Colleyville heritage we always like to ask our teachers for voice to always model for them to always ask their students and so there were four quotes that we pulled out that we took as evidence of meeting our goals so this first one there were video and reading options for each submitted requirement which allowed choice in how we learn best you offered more detailed instructions than Canvas if we needed that, and as well as a quick video overview for those who might just need a refresher. So we took comments such as this to kind of align that we met our goal of trying to span the varying needs of our teachers, not trying to, you know, cater to one side of the spectrum of where they are, but we kind of felt like it was, we met our goal of meeting right in the middle. The next quote, I think mine is, having a little lag. There it is. It's really organized very well. Why, thank you. I'm eager to work through the rest of this. <laughs> and in the future, it is really helpful, even though frustrating for some people, I'm sure, to go through this after having worked through Canvas. But in the beginning, you don't know what you don't know. And now all the tips mean something. And I, I, we experienced this over and over. Um, and in the beginning with growing with Canvas, it did it, it was a means to an end. But now that we do have, you know, almost six months of experience with this, I'm confident that Canvas Academy can replace the Canvas version and teachers will get exactly what they need from people who know them best. And um, due to growing with Canvas and experimenting so much already, I had the majority of the content already created and was able to take time to refine it and make it more beneficial for myself and my students. Uh, so this just makes our, our hearts glow because 
The whole purpose of this was to further refine and align each of us because we are on my campus alone 130 people with the same LMS, but it is so comprehensive that it can kind of work against us if we're not careful. So it's working to help us align our knowledge and skills. And the last one uh, was, I love the examples. I've been waiting to see what other teachers are doing all year. So thank you for that. And another one, I enjoy the alignment we are aiming for across our campus. I also appreciated seeing the great work and organizational skills my colleagues are doing and using. So again, um, a way to honor their hard work and how much time and energy and effort they have put in. And just to know that something you might look to be growing in in Canvas could be the teacher next door and they were just highlighted in that course. So we appreciate them for that. So our last slide focuses on just looking forward. Um, so what are we doing now? Um, we're working with learning leaders um, to meet the goal of level one completion by February. We're celebrating and lifting up teachers when they earn their level one badges through recognition by receiving a virtual badge and also an actual badge um, that they can maybe put on their door or share, put on their email signature, something like that to really uplift those, those teachers that are working hard and receiving these badges. Um, we are enlisting curriculum and instruction members to help build depth and complexity moving forward for levels two and three. So there will be continued collaboration with Ashley and I, but also with um, our AVID people and our blended learning specialists um, to focus on pedagogy and Wicker to make sure all of those things are embedded within um, the things we develop. So we're all moving forward to reach goals. And lastly, um, embedding CNI goals to increase alignment across the district. So as we wrap up again, thank you for your time tonight. Um, we, Ashley and I have worked so hard on this and we just know that it's what our teachers need. So thank you so much for letting us uh, come here um, and take your time for the night. <laughs> I, I've never seen Dr. Ryan not have anything to say, so. Well, I've got plenty to say. <laughs> Can we put a mustache on that mask? Yeah. Carson and Ashley, thank you both so much. Um, wonderful uh, presentation tonight. Do trustees, do we have any questions for Becky? Yeah. So, ladies, uh, that that was amazing. And I mean, when I saw this on the agenda, I thought, oh, Kyle's going to talk to us tonight. That was not Kyle. Um, <laughs> no offense to Kyle. <laughs> he does amazing work. Um, I, I just I especially want to let the board and, and the two of you know, um, you could not have planned this any better. So last week, the Senate Education Committee met, and um, one of the things that they were discussing was how virtual learning had gone um, so far here in the state of Texas. And I you know, was listening to other school districts talk about the fact that they had to go out and buy 5,000 hotspots at the cost of $1.2 million dollars and you know trying to get enough devices into kids hands and then finally things got around to you know what the impact is on teachers and some of the comments centered around the fact that um, there's a desperate need for professional development to help teachers with this transition and the fact that this was going to require staff who were not traditional classroom teachers. So exactly what you two are, which is instructional coaches, instructional technology coaches. And in fact, they even flat out said, don't have teachers doing tech support. And here we are right here. I, I, I cannot thank you two so much. And I wish that I had known this earlier because I would have had you testifying at that committee meeting. Um, thank you. This, this was amazing. I, I think almost all of the most successful programs in GCISD are organically grown. And as the former Dr. Newell used to say, we don't say no, we say how. And you two just did uh, amazing things for all of our teachers and, and ultimately for our kids. Thank you, thank you. I would like thank to add you, something, exactly. I mean, when you start out the first slide, kids were having to go to 10 places to find all their work, their assignments and so forth. And you made the comment, yes, we went out and found a product, but we didn't GCISD buy it yet. And here y'all are, you made it better, you built it for us. You know, we were already a district that had one-to-one -one devices that we've had for years. We've had the hotspots. Kyle and his team ordered more 
hot spots for our economic disadvantages or those that just had slow service and not the right speed, but you can build it. But if you don't have the tools and they know how to use it, and then here y'all go, you make it accessible and easy to navigate for the teachers so they can use it and for the students as well. So thank you so much for what you have done because I've seen relief in my own kids using it online and as well. So thank y'all. Nice job. Thank you, Louie and Becky. Any, Jesse, any questions? Anything else? None? Dr. Ryan? I just wrap up by saying, um, we started uh, uh, with Canvas uh, several years ago with our university prep. And so that's the system that they've been using. And so we knew that it was robust and we knew that we could do it. Um, uh, and so I do appreciate the folks that are always the trailblazers at I University Prep to try to do things first. But uh, uh, taking something um, to scale is really, really difficult uh, in a large organization. And our teachers um, have just done tremendous work, and it's been so frustrating and difficult. And you, you know, that you want to quit and you want to not do it, uh, and you want to go back to what we were doing before. Um, uh, but they've stuck with it, and with the help of the of, of the people at our campuses and the people that are centrally deployed, that um, you know, every everywhere I go, um, uh, Janie and her team uh, just get tons of praise from everybody because you're out there and you're doing the job that you're supposed to be doing, which is helping teachers uh, do this work. You know, when we have to offer in person and remote learning at the same time, and most of our secondary teachers have got to do that. It's very, very challenging. It's very challenging to have the type of education for both remote and in-person learners that that's the same. And that's really what our charge is. It's the same grading process. It's the same GPA. It's the, you know, it's the same course credit. So the courses need to be the same. Canvas allows us to do that. And um, it's just getting better and better as we go. Um, but uh, but when we start thinking about professional development days like we had before, and a lot of people wonder or wonder what they do all day on those professional development days, well, our people are working really hard and to design work that really is um, exactly what our teachers need. And you can tell from the comments and from from the type of uh, robust nature of what we've got that uh, uh, that we just kind of hit a home run on this one uh, at Colorado Heritage and. Uh, when I talked to our principals about this, and I mentioned uh, the work of, of Janie and Carson and Ashley, um, all of a sudden they were in great demand all over GCISD because they they, they designed uh, uh, such a uh, such a fantastic uh, learning environment for our teachers. So thank you, uh, Ashley, for stopping me in the middle of the hallway. Uh, thank you for showing me that, Carson. Uh, thank you for helping Ashley design that work. Janie, thank you for your leadership, and Kyle, of course, uh, um, uh, and, and the folks that are, you know, really at the forefront of our success of our students and teachers uh, and, our, and our community here in GCISD. So we'll move on to uh, the recognitions. Uh, our first recognition is uh, for uh, Trustee uh, Doug Noel. We want to start our recognitions uh, with a very special thank you to our board secretary, Doug Noel. Doug served as a GCISD trustee since May of 2017, including serving as the board secretary for the last year and a half. And um, President Pardo, I think you might want to meet him down front as I continue to read. Uh, he's a proud parent of a Gravon High School student, and in addition to being a trustee, served in the district, uh, served the district in various other capacities. Doug's volunteered at each of his son's school's dads club, including Cross Timbers Middle School, Grateful Dads, uh, and where he was the president. He also served uh, on a PTA executive boards at Timberline, Glen Hope, Cross Timbers, and the GCSD uh, Council of PTAs in various roles, including the treasurer and president. Additionally, he served uh, on the campus excellence committees at Glen Hope and Timberline. It's also on the executive board for SAGE. Uh, and Doug was an integral part of the D GCISD Board of Trustees uh, that was named the TASB Honor Board in 2018, was a finalist for HEB's Texas School Board of the Year in 2019. We do have a small token of appreciation for Doug. And um, we would also like to add that on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the entire school district, uh, we thank Doug for serving 
uh, with honor and making a continued uh, commitment to students uh, in our community. Thank you very much, Trustee Doug Noel. Let's give Doug a round of applause. appreciation for your years of service and devotion to the students and staff of Grapevine Collegeville ISD for 2017 through 2020. And underneath, I don't know, I don't know if you saw this, but y'all know his name's been misspelled the entire time. Oh, this one is? Yeah. So, so we haven't been noticed. Okay. Thank goodness. I usually notice. So, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. My pleasure. It's my honor to serve with you. A great school district, great staff. Um, it, I've seen amazing things. I'm proud of you. Thank, Thank you, you Doug. Next, we'd like to recognize the Great Von Collier Association of Retired School Employees. Representing the organization tonight are President Debbie Van Horn and Secretary Lori Bates. And um, Kyle, are they? Present with us. While we're waiting, I just want to say once again, thank you to Lori for being my son's first grade teacher and making sure that he went to second grade. <laughs> there we go. Debbie, uh, Lori, can you hear us? There's yes, Lori. Yeah. Yes. All right, so uh, Debbie and Lori are here tonight so we can publicly thank you uh, and the entire Retired Teachers Association for their continued partnership with GCISD. Uh, these special folks spent their career serving students and retiring, uh, uh, after retiring, continue to do so. So specifically, the uh, Grapevine Collierville Retired Teachers Association was driving, was the driving force between uh, behind a huge book donation earlier this semester. Uh, the organization donated books to pre-K through second grade at 11 GCISD elementary schools. Uh, in all, they donated over 1,200 books. So again, Lori and Debbie are here to, uh, with us tonight, but they represent the entire membership of the Grapevine Collierville Association Retired School Employees, and uh, they're great friends of GCISD. Thank you for all of your support and the things that you do to support our students. And uh, we just want to say uh, once again, thank you very much for pr providing our students 1200 books uh, this semester. They always uh, need uh, to develop those uh, literacy skills and uh, thank you for continuing to teach uh, even after um, um, you have, uh, have, have that retirement. So uh, again, thank you, Lori and Debbie. Any comments, uh, Lori or Debbie? No, no, sir, just thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'd like to recognize a special group of 14 GCISD seniors that have been honored as College Board National Recognition Program Scholars. This program creates pathways to college for students from underrepresented communities by awarding them academic honors and connecting them with universities across the country. These students scored in the top 2.5% of the PSAT National Merit Scholarship qualifying test takers who identify as one or more of the following. African American, Hispanic American, Latinx, uh, indigenous people or attend school in a rural area or are from a small town. Uh, in order to be eligible for this distinction, students must take the PSAT in October of their junior year, achieve the minimum requested PSAT scores, and that, could, and that varies by state, earn a cumulative GPA of 3.5 or higher by the middle of their junior year, and, and be in one of the groups that we mentioned a little bit earlier. So I know most of the 14 students are joining us tonight, not all of them. So Kyle, as I call their name, uh, if you'll kind of let us know if uh, they're joining us. And then seniors, when I call your name, if you would unmute your microphone and then tell us uh, what your plans are after graduating from GCISD. So first of all, uh, joining us tonight as part of the National African American Recognition Program from Grapevine High School, we got Jasmine Ashley. Jasmine, are you with us? Um, so, can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Jasmine. All right. Um, after college or after school, I'm planning on 
going to college. I'm not exactly sure which colleges, but I'm applying to um, a variety of schools in California, um, in Texas, UT, um, also Duke and Emory. And so I plan to major in chemical engineering and I hope to um, take advantage of a lot of research opportunities and just see um, how I can better impact my environment when I go off to college. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Congratulations to you. Uh, next, from Colville Heritage High School, we've got uh, Anna Assad. Hello, can you hear me? We can, Anna, welcome. Thank you. Um, after high school, I also plan to go to college, um, most likely in a Northeastern state like uh, Pennsylvania or, or Massachusetts. And I plan on studying something in the um, biochem range so I can go into STEM whenever I uh, graduate college and uh, also graduate uh, graduate school. So that's my plan. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us, Anna, and, and uh, good luck to you. Uh, also from Colorado Heritage High School, we've got Safa Hassan. Not with us tonight. Uh, also uh, from Colorado Heritage High School, we've got uh, Isis McGee. Isis is not with us. Okay. Uh, from Colorado Heritage High School, we got Alyssa Mitchell. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Melissa. Um, after high school, I do plan to go to college and I plan to major in business and minor in psychology. Um, and then hopefully after that, um, start my own small business or company. Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa. Good luck to you and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, also from Colorado Heritage High School, we got Nicole Obang. Hi, can Hi, you hear me? You bet. Hi, Nicole. Um, so I plan to go to college, uh, not sure which one, but somewhere here in Texas on the pre-med track, either majoring in nutrition, kinesiology, or psychology, and then minoring in Spanish, and then get to medical school, and then hopefully become a pediatrician. That sounds like a great plan, Nicole. Thank you for joining us tonight. Congratulations to you. Uh, as a part of the National Hispanic Recognition Program from Culver Heritage High School, we've got uh, Alana uh, Gahan. Alana didn't join us tonight. Okay, from Culver, Culver Heritage High School, we've got Sarah Hatch. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Sarah. We can hear you. Um, after high school, I... I plan to go to college. I just don't know where. I just know I want to stay in Texas and I want to major in computer science and minor in music. That sounds like a great plan. Thank you for joining us tonight, Sarah. Congratulations. Uh, also uh, from Grapevine High School, we've got Nicholas Heredia. Nicholas couldn't join us tonight. Also from Grayvon High School, we've got Cade Leverett. Hi, Cade. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. There you. we go. Um, Man, I'm glad you I'm turned your camera on, Cade. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Um, my, plans, my plans after high school, I want to go to a university. I'm not sure where. Still deciding that. But major in business and minor in psychology hopefully find something where i can be successful and happy thank you very much Kay. that sounds outstanding good luck to you and congratulations from call of heritage high school we got uh, gavin maxwell okay gavin can join us also uh, from a uh, grapevine high school mark poveda hi mark hi can you hear me Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure where I want to go to college yet, but I plan to go and study mechanical engineering, probably somewhere here down in the south. 
All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate uh, you being with us tonight, and good luck to you. Congratulations. From the Collegiate Academy, we've got Isabella Ruprich. Okay, so Isabella couldn't join us, and uh, from Grapevine High School, Sophia, Val Sophia Valverde. And Sophia couldn't join us. So again, congratulations to all of our College Board National Recognition Program scholars, and thank you for joining us tonight. For our next recognition, it's very exciting. For the third straight year, GCISD has earned one of the top honors available to any employer in the DFW Metroplex, being named a Dallas Morning News Top 100 Place to Work. The Dallas Morning News solicits nominations each spring, then gathers feedback from employees from all the nominated employers, and companies are graded in leadership, sense of mission, career opportunities, culture, pay, and benefits. GCISD ranked ninth among large companies, which is Companies over 500 employees, and that was the highest ranking of the four school districts that were part of the top 100. It's an honor every year to know that our staff value the work that we're all accomplishing for our students, but this year is an extra special year because we know that our staff had to innovate overnight to support students during the global health pandemic. These unprecedented times have certainly been stressful. However, our staff have pulled together, relied on each other, and truly demonstrated why GCISD is the best. Congratulations to Jimmy Paget. GCISD Executive Director of Human Resources and the entire HR team that works hard behind the scenes and are instrumental in making this recognition possible. Uh, also, congratulations to our teachers and our support staff and um, uh, all the folks that work together to make GCISD a fantastic place with our principals and our leaders and our directors and executive directors and um, um, just everybody that pulls together, every single person is important in this school district and, and uh, every single person uh, had a part uh, in this award and every single person hopefully takes pride in this award for the third uh, straight year. So our values of purpose and innovation community uh, are on display all the time and we're really excited about this top 100 workplace award. Next, we'd like to recognize one of our campus counseling teams for receiving the Lone Star State Counselor, uh, School Counselor Association Award in 2016. Uh, the Lone Star State School Counselor Association developed a progressive award system that includes three levels, bronze, silver, and gold. And we're proud to announce that the Kyle Heritage High School Counseling Team has earned the silver award. Each level of the award is met with increased levels of rigor designed to elevate school counselor programs to national recognition. Schools received the bronze, silver, or gold award that uh, they've demonstrated outstanding comprehensive counseling programs that were data-driven, focused on goal completion, and aligned with the uh, national model. So tonight, joining us, uh, hopefully, is uh, Amanda Vargas, who's our lead counselor at College Heritage, Kimberly Hill, our director of counseling. Amanda, I see you. Are, are, can you hear me, Amanda? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, congratulations on the silver, silver award. Uh, of course, uh, on behalf of the school district and the board of trustees, we certainly want to say congratulations to you and your entire team. Uh, do you have a second to say a couple of award, uh, words about this award? I'd love to. I Thanks for having me here for the recognition. And I just want to say congratulations to our entire counseling staff. Um, it's a full year of works, um, day in and day out, everyone just coming in and having a heart for kids. And so no one joins uh, school counseling for recognitions. So when something like this happens, it's very exciting. And um, I just appreciate everyone's work in our office every single day. And I'm super proud to be part of the team. Thank you, Amanda. Congratulations. And I see also Amberly uh, is, is here. Amberly, uh, thank you for leading our counseling team all across GCISD. Uh, you've certainly been uh, busy these days. Uh, uh, would you like to say a couple of words uh, about uh, this situation, this award? Sure, I am very proud of Colorado Heritage's counseling team. They've worked tirelessly to take care of students, take care of teachers, and to continue on. It's been a difficult time, but they have been able to just care about kids, regardless of the circumstances, and I'm just proud of the work that they do. Thank you, Amberly, and thank you, Amanda. Congratulations to both of you on the Silver Award. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
And wrapping up, we have the Red Ribbon Week poster uh, uh, contest. And each year in October during Red Ribbon Week, the district org, uh, coordinates friendly contests to engage students in supporting a drug-free message. Across the district, our students participated in a poster contest and a public, public service announcement video contest. And tonight we're gonna recognize the top winners in each of these categories. Red Ribbon Poster Contest is for elementary and middle school students, and tonight we're recognizing the first place winners in each grade, and so uh, we'll call their name uh, and uh, we'll call their grade as well in the school, but uh, we'll see if they can, uh, if they've joined us, then uh, we'll let them announce their school and, and what grade they're in as well. So, um, uh, first of all, we've got uh, Aditri Balaji. Yes. Go ahead. Please unmute me. Can you hear me, Kayla? Can you hear me? We can hear you. You bet. Go ahead. Um, thank you for saying me. I won the first prize. I like to win, and I like art, and I like to paint and draw the most. Well, congratulations to you. You're fantastic, and we can't wait to see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we've got uh, Gwari Day. Gwari can join us. Uh, we've got uh, Zishan Lakani. Zishan, are you here? There you go. Can you hear mm -hmm. me? Yes, we can. My favorite thing to do is I like to read and I like to do painting and math. And my name is Zishan. Well, and congratulations, Zishan. We're proud of you. Good job. Hopefully, we'll see you back again next year. Next, we've got uh, Om Dave. Not joining us tonight. Sophie Winter. Hi, Sophie. Uh, um, hi. <clears throat> um. I'm Sophie Winter, I go to Heritage, and I like arts and crafts and making stuff. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Sophie, and congratulations uh, on your award. Thank you. Next, we've got uh, Lily Minyard. Don't think Lily could join us tonight. What about Corn and Keith? Corn and couldn't uh, join us uh, either. So, um, Kaylee Newlip. Okay, folks are busy tonight, I understand. So uh, th that's our uh, Red Ribbon Week poster contest winners. Uh, also as a part of Red Ribbon Week, we hold a public service announcement contest. This is where students create videos showing how they say no to drugs and how they live a drug-free life. And at this, li at this time, we wanna recognize our winner, Caleb Knoll. There's Caleb. Caleb, can you tell us uh, uh, what school you attend, what grade you're in? You there, Caleb? Are y'all, can you hear me? Okay, now we can hear you. Okay, so I'm Caleb. I like, I'm a, I go to Heritage Elementary. I'm in fourth grade and I like math. All right, good deal. Well, congratulations on winning the uh, public service announcement contest. Uh, all the poster winners and the public service video is going to be uh, posted on uh, our, our website tomorrow. Uh, so congratulations, Caleb, and all the other winners. And we also want to have a special shout out to Robin Davis, student advocate at Color Heritage High School, who organizes this contest every single year. Of course, Robin does a fantastic job. Uh, working uh, all across the, the school district. And um, that concludes this evening's recognitions. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. What great recognitions they were. Um, it's hard to follow that first one. <laughs> she was excited to be on. She's excited to be here tonight. Um, we will move on to open form, and I don't believe we had anyone sign up for open form. So we'll move on to reports of the superintendent. And first is item A, to canvas the election results from the November 3rd, 2020 school board election. Yes, the uh, board trustees will inspect the cumulative report official. 
and uh, the, <coughs> the uh, voting results of each of the precinct reports furnished by the Tarrant County Elections Office. Those are attachments uh, uh, to this particular item. Uh, I will read the uh, vote count. In place five, Coley Cantor received 13,714 votes. Tommy Snyder, 11,039 votes. Lori Crenshaw, 11,032 votes. And so a runoff election is required for place five. We'll talk more about the date of that uh, election in just a few moments. Now, place six, Casey Ford had 21,037 votes. Doug Noel had 14,141 votes. And in place seven, Jorge Rodriguez had 18,700 votes and Casey Tischer had 16,654 votes. Uh, the recommendation is for the board trustees to approve the canvas of the election returns and name Casey Ford, place six, and Jorge Rodriguez, place seven, as the winners of the, new th of the November the 3rd, 2020, board of trustees election for the Great Vine Colleyville Independent School District. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. We have a recommendation. Do I have um, a motion? Madam President. Jesse, I'm sorry. Yes, Jesse. Uh, yes, um, I'd like to move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation, please. Thank you, Jesse. And do I have a second? Mindy, thank you very much. Any questions? Any discussion? None. Seeing none. All those in favor? Motion carries 6 0. Move on to item B statement of elected officer and administration of the oath of office. Yes, at this point, uh, this is an exciting time in the in the life of a school district. Uh, Ms. Hutto is going is the clerk of the board this evening and also a notary. She's going to administer the oath of office to our newly elected trustees. And uh, first of all, uh, place six, Casey Ford. Casey, please joining us. Uh, please join us right uh, up here. And you can see, and we got the family coming in. That's good. Y'all come on. <laughs> Just right there, right there. there You're go. standing perfectly. <laughs> Casey, we're going to start with you. Let's get to. Uh, let's make sure, Addison. You, have you got a good angle for everybody? <laughs> okay. All right. There okay, we go. Casey, for place six, I'm going to be giving you your certificate. Uh, we'll do this all at the same time. Uh, I'm also going to give you your statement of your elected officer. I'll have you sign that when you come for the second document. And now I'm going to ask you to repeat after me for the oath. So if you'll raise your right hand and repeat after me, I state your name. I to solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the duties of the office of the school board trustee. Of the Great Vine Colleyville Independent School District of the state of Texas, and will do to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of this state. So help you God. Congratulations. Casey, can you introduce us to everybody? Yes, this is my lovely wife, Deanna. Hi. This is my lovely son, he's Jace. He's going to be nine this January. He's in third grade. I hope. Hi, Jace. Sweetie over here is, is Elena. She is six in kindergarten. I don't know. This little one right here is Avery. He's in pre K. She will be a Glen Oak Gator in a couple of years. There we go. <laughs> excited. That's good. Jace, I've got a job. Jace, I've got a job for you. Come right over here. Right on top of that, you can see your dad's nameplate. And you can place it on that little place that right below it. There we go. Oh. All right. Good job. Good job. Okay. 
Okay, Jorge, are you ready for play seven? <laughs> We're glad you're here. Okay, for play seven, I have a copy of your, your certificate. I'll also have you sign your statement of election when you come up. I think and, they probably knew that they were not on the time. <laughs> and then if you repeat after me, raise your right hand. I state your name. I Jorge Rodriguez. Do solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. I will faithfully execute. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of school board trustee. Of school board trustee. Of the Great Vine Colleyville Independent School District. Of the Great Vine Colleyville Independent School District. Of the state of Texas. Of the state of Texas. And will, to the best of my ability. I will, to the best of, of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution and laws. The Constitution and laws. Of the United States. Of the United States. And of this state. Uh, and of this state. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. We move on to item C act on appointment of board secretary. I believe this is this results of the uh, November 3rd election created a vacancy in the board secretary position. And so vacancy among officers, the board shall be filled by majority action of the board or an appointment. And so, uh, president Pardo, thank you very much. So, um, at this time, I did check with legal and from, I can just appoint until our December meeting. So I would like to, uh, if there are no objections, I'd like to appoint um, Jorge Rodriguez as the board secretary and until our December um, election and swearing in. So if I see no objections, um, I'd like a, a motion in to uh, have Jorge Rodriguez as our board secretary. I move we accept the president's recommendation of Jorge Rodriguez as secretary. Thank you, Becky, in a second. No Louis. second. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Jorge Rodriguez, the secretary, raise your hand. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you and thank you, Jorge. <laughs> <laughs> and we have 30 people speaking in just a moment, so that now. <laughs> oh, move on to item, move on to item D, a health update for the 2020 2021 school year. Yes, uh, our uh, Director of Health Services, Amy Taldo, is here as she is uh, every month to give us a, a health update about uh, uh, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, the one that uh, she'll provide tonight, um, it's not as positive as it has been in the past. I think everybody's aware that uh, uh, the virus has uh, had a bit of, a, uh, of an uptick lately. So, uh, Amy, um, are, you, are you sharing your screen or is somebody else sharing that information for you? 
I um, need to ask Kyle to allow me privileges to share my screen. Good evening, uh, members of the board and Dr. Ryan. Um, again, I come to you with the um, update on COVID-19 and we're gonna talk about the Tarrant County metrics. Um, once again, I did um, a slideshow so that we can kind of look at past numbers compared to current numbers. I think it's a little bit easier um, when you can have a visual. So in metric one, the positivity rate, um, they really want it to be under 10%, ideally less than five. And um, as of today, we are sitting at 16% um, positivity rate on tests that are um, completed in Tarrant County. Metric two, got a little click happy there. There we go. Metric two and metric five um, are very similar in that uh, metric two states the rate of cases reported needs to be less than 2,000 per week. And then metric five talks about declining and stable uh, case counts. So as we look um, here in November, at the very end of October, we were at 4,000. And then um, today, our case count for last week was over 8,000 um, new cases in Tarrant County. Metric three talks about COVID-like illnesses. It's what they're seeing in the um, emergency room. And it needs to be trending down for two weeks. And um, we have not seen a downward trend in quite some time. Uh, last month at the board meeting, it was 3.7. And today it sits at 6.1%. And the last metric, well, last but not least, is the metric four, which talks about the hospitalizations and occupied um, beds that need to be below 10%. And today we are sitting at um, 20 percent and just a couple of weeks ago, October 26, we were sitting at 14 percent. So our um, numbers do tend, are, are climbing and we're seeing increases in our metrics. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. So this is an information only um, report, so no, no voting, but does anyone have any questions for Amy tonight? Becky. Yeah, so Amy, I guess. There we go. The way you can see me. Um, so unfortunately, the impression that I'm getting, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So the district put in processes and procedures. Um, well, really back at the start of school. And then of course we went in person uh, right after Labor Day. And so during that time, um, can you speak to um, things that the district has done to enhance and robust those? And my concern is that while the district is taking adequate steps um, over the last two and a half months, that uh, the issue seems to be outside of our campuses. Can you address that a little bit? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, we are seeing um, a certain level of uh, events that we have heard through um, different um, avenues that um, are producing uh, positive cases and then spreading to other individuals that were participating in the non campus non school activity events. Um, and those um, are are traced um, and then confirmed. Um, when other positives have come up and then, um, you know, different people have come to us and said, I was at that event and now I'm feeling, you know, I'm not feeling well. And so um, we are linking a lot of positive cases to outside events. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, Amy, I have a question here on, on the ones that we're quarantining. So we are seeing, and I understand that we're seeing the trend that they're getting it at whatever event or party or whatever they're doing outside of school, coming to school and then becoming ill while they're at school. So then we quarantine those that need to be around. What number are we seeing that are becoming positive from those that are quarantined from within school? Do we have a number for in that for that segment of people? Yes, ma'am. So the week of um, November 2nd, um, we quarantined 380 students, and of that 380, 11 became positive. 
Last week, um, we quarantined 455 students and staff, some, some are staff. And out of that, we had 16 that um, became positive. I did not do that math like I did last month. I apologize, but I have a feeling it's probably over 3% um, or, you know, hovering around the 3 to 4% still. That's great. That's ex that's great. That's exactly those are the numbers I was. I have just been curious and people have asked that question. So thank you, Amy, very much. Jorge. Could we post those numbers on the on the dashboard? The one that you just asked, because I see the dashboard. Uh, it has the the weekly number, so the 388, the 380 and the 455 that she mentioned for the last two weeks. But it would be nice to have also that number of 11 and 16 of whatever what's um, whatever was close contacts actually became positive. I, I agree because that really is showing us that it's not happening at school. Correct. It's really showing that it's happening from the lack of. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, and Dr. Ryan, thank you so much for improving the dashboard. There's a lot better numbers and it's a lot clearer to see. So thank you for that. Yeah. So what this comes down to is wash your hands, wear your mask, and stay six feet apart. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. There we go. So, um, Ms. Taldo, I... Oh, yes, okay. Becky. Um, so there was actually, um, there's an interesting article in the uh, Wall Street Journal this uh, weekend that talked about uh, equating this with like layers of Swiss cheese, right? That there are, <laughs> I, I got you, this sounds familiar. So that, you know, Swiss cheese, it has holes in it, but um, when you line it up, you know, there are the different layers end up eventually blocking things from going all the way through um, a, a Swiss cheese, right? If it was all sliced. And so what I'm seeing is that the district, I mean, we, we can't, the school district cannot do everything. It cannot be responsible for everything. Um, and so we're responsible for what happens on our campuses and the, pro the processes and procedures that we put in place for our students and for our staff. And so I, this, this idea of the Swiss cheese, we need the rest of the community to, to put their layer in as well. And so, um, you know, we're actually keeping six feet apart in my house because we have a, a little event coming up on Monday that we really want to attend down at Round Rock. Um, but I, I think it's, it would be helpful for the community to also understand that their, their job in this is maybe not exactly the same as what the school district is doing. I'm not fumigating my house um, on a regular basis, but that those other things are important and, and one of the things that the Wall Street Journal pointed out is that when all of those layers are in place, that makes the need for um, school shutdowns very minimal because then you've got those multiple layers working together that, that makes those numbers go back in the direction we'd rather be seeing. Um, so I guess, if, if the only other thing I could think of is I know we're imparting upon, to our campuses, you know, what students and staff need to be doing. Um, it would be helpful if the rest of our community, you know, organizations and leaders would, you know, continue to to get the same message out. And maybe their their protocols might not look what it does as running a school, but that those things are equally important so that we can have and continue to have in person school. I agree, and I, I will tell you, I don't know Greg Ryan, but I know the, the mayor of Colleyville, he just put out a video, and his was really emphasizing, if you're out, wear a mask. If you're out, you know, stay six feet apart and wash your hands. So, and I'm sure, you know, Mayor Tate's doing the same thing. Um, but again, it's all about the mask. I know we hate them, but it's all about the mask. Lisa, hey, I got a question for you. Um, do you feel like these students and parents are self-reporting? The majority of them are, 
in terms of either symptoms or going getting tested from a standpoint because you know let's go back pre-covid you know we said if your child has a fever or throws up can't return to school within 24 hours you know and a lot of kids the next morning be like oh you're you're okay give you some benadryl give you some tylenol you don't have a fever and send you back and i know it's subjective and you, you don't know who's not but from your experience over this with the last six to nine months do you feel like our community and our parents and our students are doing a good job of identifying the symptoms getting tested and then reporting it to us i um i do um i do know that um they're probably like you said it's subjective and there probably are some that are not um however we are very very busy um with cases and contact tracing and so um you know there's there's a huge level like today we had 16 cases um and so working those pretty much almost 12 hours today um you know that's a lot of kids and that's a lot of parents that are letting us know um, what's going on and both remote and in person and then remote with extracurricular. So um, it would be hard to say a percentage or all, but yes, they definitely are communicating with their campus nurses and letting them know when their child's not um, feeling well and kind of talking through the process of could this be something that could be an alternate diagnosis and let's get you to the doctor and figure it out, um, such as, you know, strep throat or ear infections or sinus infections. Or is this something that's COVID related um, that has the same symptoms and we need, um, you know, a negative COVID test as well. Um, we've got some great testing sites out there. Some are free um, to families, completely free. And so we're trying to make sure that we're being um, very mindful of where we send them and their financial situation and also just getting results back in a timely manner. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Amy. Yes. Jesse. Yes. Yeah, uh, just a couple of questions. So if, if I understand correctly, and then based on the comments that, uh, that Lisa and Becky were making, um, Amy, so in your opinion, then our message is getting across to our students overall in terms of wearing a mask and the social distancing and, and washing your hands. Would you, would you agree with that? I agree that it is in the school setting. I think um, outside of the school setting, um, it's a different set of rules. It's um, it's a personal home and personal family, um, you know, uh, rules and how they approach um, the pandemic and how they approach the disease. And so in school, um, you know, I, I have not heard um, that kids are refusing or there's, you know, there's been anything like that. So I do think there's just one set of rules for school and there may be another set of rules for the family and how they approach it. Okay, and then to your last comment that you just made um, with the flu season and the cold season coming on board, are, are we going to be able to distinguish from from those youngsters and teachers and staff? And I see you nod no. Okay, <laughs> you, you know what I was going to ask. If there was a way to, to have a different set of numbers for those kids that are in t and staff that are indeed are a cold or the flu <laughs> versus... Oh. What we can do is, um, uh, and Tarrant County has said, don't try to separate in, uh, influenza-like illness versus COVID-like illness. Just report because they're very much the same symptoms. Um, if we do have a diagnosis that comes back that it's a sinus infection, strep throat, um, ear infection, um, we can certainly track those once we get an alternate diagnosis back if we need to start doing that. Um, but kind of going into it, the symptoms are so similar that we... Um, we just we have to just kind of assume everybody is COVID until proven otherwise. <laughs> and um, but yes, we can certainly start tracking alternate diagnosis that come back to us after we send them out for sure. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Amy, this is Casey. How are you doing? Hi, good evening. So quick question. Have we recommended for our students to actually go get flu shots? So that way we can help bifurcate out what we think would be flu versus COVID. If we have our students and parents in the community go get their flu shots, then that would hopefully be less students that are in the school sick. So when you do have actual cases of COVID potentially, you'd be able to know if it really was flu or COVID. We have not officially um, put out any type of advertising to get flu shots. That is something I can look into and um, talk to communications about. Um, and, and most families do choose that. There are fam some families that choose not to. Um, but advertising would would um, be something I can look into. 
Thank you. Uh, and one more item. Um, it seems like that we actually being in school is actually a good benefit for the community. So I think we should keep doing what we're doing and, and washing our hands and, and, you know, having the students and, and teachers, you know, continue to do what they're doing. And it seems like being in school is actually really good for us. It's helping do social distancing and keep, you know, families separated throughout the day. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Any, any other questions, Becky? Yeah, I have one other question. Um, yeah, it's the other, what, 16 hours of the day that uh, were problematic for us. So um, I know I was on the uh, TASB uh, conference call with the commissioner last week, and um, Dr. Ryan, he mentioned that they'll be uh, rolling out a rapid testing project. And I know that he discussed this with the superintendents as well. Um, I'm concerned that some of his guidelines are a little bit off. For example, they're going to recalculate on the 15th of every month, which was unfortunately yesterday for us. Um, are, are we going to have the opportunity to participate in this? I know the commissioner mentioned that they've ordered a bunch of stuff and it'll be in when it's in. And I know we've heard that from TEA before. Um, do you have any information on this or Ms. Taldo? Dr. Brown? Yeah, and Amy has uh, quite a bit of information about that. And um, uh, so uh, we are going to be able to offer that at our schools uh, on a voluntary basis uh, for people to have, uh, uh, it's a rapid test. So Amy, why don't you the expert here? So let's, uh, I'll turn that over to you. Okay. Um, it is a K through 12 um, COVID testing program and it's through TEA and the D Texas Division of Emergency Management. And um, once we submit our application, which is actually a very simple application, um, we would be sent um, supplies, PPE and testing for an allocation predetermined according to our hospitalization rate and our PEMS for last year, our, our enrollment for last year. Um, we've been working towards, <clears throat> excuse me, getting um, a few kind of ducks in a row um, that have to do with waste management on how we dispose of the test and the PPE after we do them. I mean, do the test and um, the nurses will need to be um, trained, which I've got a meeting with them tomorrow. And um, also um, there's some inventory issue, you know, the additional inventory that they will have to do for their PPE, PPE and testing. Um, and so there's just, uh, there's been just several things that I wanted to make sure we had in place before we roll it out. Um, and the, it's a called the Binax Now um, Rapid Antigen COVID Test, and it is a, a lower nasal swab. So you don't have to go up very high and um, they do the nasal swab and uh, you put it into what looks like a credit card and drop the um, reagent on it, seal it up. 15 minutes later, you have your results. And so I've been working on the protocol for what do we do when those results are positive? What do we do when those results are negative? And I've sent that to Tarrant County for them to look over. And I noticed in my email this evening that Josh has emailed me back. And so um, I will be, um, you know, just looking at any comments that he made on our protocol. Um, I do feel like it's going to be a wonderful toolbox in our nurses. Um, you know, I mean, a tool in the toolbox for the nurses to utilize and also just a convenience for the families that struggle to get everybody in and get everybody tested. Um, I, I'm just, um, I'm excited about it. Um, but it's, uh, it's new. Uh, we would be 1 of the 1st people doing it. So there's obviously a little bit of. Um, concern, just making sure that everything goes off um, very well. Th thank you. He he did have 18 pages of his infamous PowerPoint presentation, so I appreciate all the work <laughs> that you were doing on this. And um, I was fortunate to be able to be on that conference call and kind of hear, you know, what the concerns are of other school districts. And it sounds like you've got this really well in hand that this is not as simple as you know, a box shows up from TEA and we start testing people. So thank you for your expertise on that. You're welcome. One, I have a quick question, Amy. Are you seeing the flu coming in? I mean, if we're saying that we're having to report the flu as a COVID test, is that the reason our number's going up or is it truly COVID? Are you no, it's truly COVID. Yes, okay. Okay. Any, all the numbers 
Yeah, all the numbers that I gave you are truly COVID. And actually, um, the nurses do tell me when they have flu, and we actually have not seen um, an increase in flu yet. It probably is the distance and the mask, um, because flu, as um, they're kind of finding out, flu may there's flu and then COVID, and the contagion is a little bit different. The R not factor is what it's called is a little bit different for flu than it is for COVID. So, okay, thank you, uh, Jorge. Um, I just had a question for Amy or Dr. Ryan. I mean, how, are we hearing anything from the from the office of the governor about possible changes, close, you know, close of schools? Because I mean, Amy made a really nice uh, uh, description of the metrics, and everything is going the wrong direction, right? Um, significantly. So even though we might be doing really good. And hopefully we'll continue to do that in our schools. I wonder if we have hearing from the state about possible changes because things are not looking well. So I have not heard of any changes from the governor's office. Amy, I don't know if uh, if Tarrant County has mentioned anything like that to you or not. Um, no, nothing from the governor's office. Um, I know Judge Whitley is asking the cities to be proactive and making sure people are wearing masks that are out in public and doing what we can so that things can keep moving forward. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Amy? Thank you, Amy, very much. Amy. Thank you. Y'all have a good evening. You have a good night. Thank you. We'll move on to item E, act on the order of school trustee runoff election. Yes, and item A, we canvassed the election, and uh, we did note that there was uh, needed to be a runoff, and so this item is about the runoff. The 2020 school trustee runoff election is scheduled for December the 8th, 2020, the second Tuesday in December. The order of school trustee election calls for a runoff election to fill an opening for a three-year term in place five between Coley Cantor and Tommy Snyder. Early voting locations include the Rec and Grapevine, Colleyville City Hall. Additional locations for early voting and Election Day voting by personal appearance shall be published by the Tarrant County Elections Office, and uh, we'll certainly uh, publish those as well. Uh, the recommendation is for the Board of Trustees to order a school trustee runoff election for Place 5 for Tuesday, December the 8th, 2020. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? Jesse? Yes, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation, please. And a second. I'll second. Jorge, any uh, questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. I like how you're the one that made the motion, Jesse. You just want this thing to. <laughs> the trustee that will never leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, move on to item F. Act like on a bad penny. <laughs> <laughs> Item F, um, act on the resolution to provide an appropriate funds for a one-time lump sum compensation payment for eligible employees. Dr. Ryan? Uh, yes, for this item, I'll ask uh, Diane to, to briefly take us, uh, take us through this quick item before um, I provide the recommendation. Dr. Ryan, I would be happy to do that. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So the board is authorized by the Texas Education Code to expend district funds for purposes necessary in the con conduct, conduct of the public schools as determined by the board. Included in, in that, um, in our staff that are employed by contracts, we currently have a clause in the contract that states that they may receive additional compensation during the contract year if certain financial conditions of the district have been met. Employment requirements have been met and the board of trustees approves it. Non contract staff members of the district may also receive additional compensation uh, during the year. Tonight, later tonight, we're going to present to you the uh, financial audit report for the 2019 20 fiscal year. And that report shows that the expenditures in the general operating budget. are only 97.7% of the final budget. So uh, we did come under budget on the expenditure side. And also the district um, ended the fiscal year with a general operating surplus of $1,025,313. Therefore, based on this information, those financial uh, goals uh, necessary to provide the one-time compensation payment to employees have been met. So tonight, uh, the recommendation is that 
uh, the board approve a resolution to provide a one time lump sum compensation payment for eligible employees and to appropriate the funds from the general operating and child nutrition fund balances for this one time expense. The eligible employees that will receive the payment will be those full time employees employed by the district on or prior to November 16th, 2020, which is today. And the compensation payment will be 1% of the employee's current base gross base salary or $500, whichever is greater. And for our part time employees employed by the district on or prior to November 16th, 2020, the compensation payment would be 1% of the employee's current gross base salary. The proposed payment will be issued as a one time lump sum amount for the 2021 school year only on Friday, December 4th, 2020. So this means it will not be included in next year's um, budget as ongoing compensation. So as far as the appropriation side, uh, the recommendation improves, uh, includes approval to make a budget appropriation to both the general operating and child nutrition budget. So for the general operating, um, the cost of this additional compensation will be 1,083,276. And on the child nutrition budget, the cost would be 51,761. And so I wanna thank you guys for uh, your consideration as I feel like this will have a really positive impact on all of our employees that are having a really hard year and working really, really hard. Thank you, Diane. The recommendation is for board trustees to approve the resolution that provides a one-time lump sum compensation payment to full-time employees employed on or prior to November 16, 2020, in the amount of 1% of current gross base salary or $500, whichever is greater, and to part-time employees employed on or prior to November 16, 2020, 1% of their current gross base salary, and further to appropriate $1,083,276 from the general operating fund balance and $51,761 from the child nutrition fund balance for the additional compensation expense. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? Becky? I move we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you, Becky, and a second? I'll second. Louis, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Becky? Yeah, so Dan, I know that um, this is a topic that comes up frequently at our budget workshops every year as to how we can um, do this. Um, I know that we start putting the budget together, usually, as you'll see tonight already on the agenda, <laughs> by about this time or and really kick off in January. And so I, I know that obviously last school year, at the beginning of the school year and up until March, this really wasn't on the radar. Um, but I really appreciate the cost savings by employees to allow us to be able to do this. And I wish that we could do what other districts did with jumping out there with an extremely large amount. I looked at the financials of uh, some of those uh, pretty high payments and uh, they have a substantially larger fund balance than we do and receive a substantially larger amount of money from the state than we do and have a higher tax rate than we do. And, um, oh yeah, they don't have a Robin Hood payment. Um, so I really appreciate um, your hard work and your team's hard work on this, as well as the employees, you know, who, who really are the ones that kind of made this happen. And I hope that this helps along with our earlier action of, you know, compensating teachers who are covering um, classes when we can't find subs. Um, so, I, again, I, I wish we could do more, but I appreciate the work that you did. And, you know, we talk about this every year. Um, it comes up in all of our budget workshops. Um, and then I'm, I'm glad we're able to make it happen again this year. Thank you. Thank you for your support. That's right. They're working so hard. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that true? It's so, I'm so glad we can do it of all years this year, but as difficult as it's been. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to reiterate what Becky said from regards to, you know, this wasn't discussed about, there wasn't an idea that we could do this at the beginning of our budget planning season. And then as the year went on, the teachers, staff, our energy savings program, everything, our 1300 employees are the ones that helped with this. 
and cost savings to allow us to do this. And then, you know, several months back, you came to us and we're starting to talk about this. You know, we've been talking about this for several months because we saw what our actual expenditures were going to be versus what we had budgeted. And it was like, hey, we can do this. And what a great reward because we have teachers dual teaching, you know, in person, online. These teachers are the hardest working people right now, along with our fir first responders as well. So, Anne and your team, thank you so much for your hard work and for the board for you bringing to the, this to us several months ago and presenting this possibility to us and for us discussing it and having meaningful um, debates about it through our open session uh, budget workshops that we have. And so, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Louie. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. Casey? Hey, Dan, how you doing? Good. A uh, couple quick questions. What's the total percentage uh, this payment as opposed to as the total percentage of the expenditure? So I think our expenditures for the year were, you know, 150 million. Do you, do you have that number on the top of your head? Sorry, I don't have the financials in front of me. Yeah, the operating expenditures, we'd have to take out the recapture. Right. So if we take out 140, about 140 million, because if you take out the recapture and the tip payment, mm -hmm. our total operating expenditure is about 140 million. This so, is about a 1% payment. Yes. And then going to Robinhood, has our Robinhood de decreased the last few years that we remit to the state? Yes, it has decreased. When House Bill 3 was passed, huh. um, the recapture did decrease, but um, the tax collections also decreased. Okay. So it wasn't, um, we worked real hard in communicating that because it looked like our Robin Hood reduced $10 million. Mm -hmm. if, you just, if you just looked on the financials, you would see that, but you also have to look on the expenses on the revenue side as well, mm -hmm. that with the tax compression, the tax collections also were reduced. How much did the tax uh, revenues reduce? They were a so the Robin Hood reduced about 10 million and the overall net funding that we received on from House Bill 3 was 3 million. So our our revenues decreased 3 million or 3 10 million. million. Yes. But the payment we remit to the state went down how much? It went down the the payment to Robin Hood went down 10 million. So okay. an overall net of three million is what we got. So what's that decrease in revenue? Seven million. Okay. Seven million a decrease in re tax so, revenue. So there's a little bit of wiggle room there, which that's good to know. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go on. And Moot ask for the vote. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you again, Diane, to you and your staff. And I know this puts a um, one more thing on your plate to do, try to get this done before the end of the year. So thank you very much. I think this is one of those things that uh, the finance team will be glad yes, to do. Yes, I'm sure. So, um, uh, yes. Because I'm always happy to do that, but it, you know, they work really hard and, and they they always have positive attitudes. Yes, they do. I know our employees are going to be uh, thrilled with uh, with your decision. So uh, on behalf of our uh, employees, I'd just like to say thank you to the board for uh, for making this decision for them this evening. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. We move on to item G, act on the 2019-2020 comprehensive annual financial report. Ryan? Yes, we're, um, we, uh, this is the evening that we have the report on the uh, CAFR or the comprehensive annual financial report. And so um, I'll turn it over to Diane. I know uh, Carl is here too, um, somewhere. Oh, he's standing with us. There he is. Okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and discuss my part first. Uh, the Texas Education Code requires an audit of each Texas school district's financial records. Uh, and the audit must be performed by Texas certified or public accountant holding a permit from the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy and be completed following the close of the fiscal year, which for GCISD is June 30th. The audit report will be filed with the state um, by the deadline, which is November 27th. 
And some of the highlights um, in the report include um, the district did receive an unqualified opinion, which means the financial statements fairly present the district's financial position. Uh, the audit found no weaknesses in internal controls nor instances of non-compliance with grants and contracts. As I mentioned earlier, the district did end the fiscal year with an increase to the general operating fund balance of $1,025,313. And I do wanna point out that that was, um, even with the reduction in the ADA uh, for the replacement of the federal funds, um, that we were able to uh, defer to the 2021 school year to help us with COVID expenditures. So um, I was really proud of the fact that we um, were able to um, have that surplus there. And the district ended the fiscal year with a general operating fund balance of 58.1 million, which is 44.9% of operating expenditures. And of course, this is above our 20% fund balance policy. The district also ended the fiscal year with a debt service fund balance of 64.3 million. And of course, this money is used to make the uh, debt payment in August of 2020. And then we will provide uh, funds for the bond prepayment in February of 2021. Uh, the district ended the fiscal year with a use of the child nutrition fund balance of $137,000. $416 and an ending fund balance of 1.2 million. And this fund balance meets the Texas Department of Agriculture requirements. Um, we all know that child nutrition was hit really hard on the revenue side of things um, with the closure of the school. And uh, they did a great job of minimizing um, that impact to their fund balance. Um, for the 1819 fiscal year, of course, we were notified a couple of months back that we received the um, Governmental Finance Officers Association and Association of School Business Officials Certificate for our um, excellence in financial reporting. And of course, we will submit this report tonight um, for, the award, for consideration of the awards um, as well. I am going to turn it over to Carl Deaton with Hankins, Eastop, Deaton, Ton, and C accounting firm in Denton. And he's going to just go over a few things um, in the audit report. Okay, there we go. thank you. Okay, so I, I wanna begin with page 50. Uh, page 50, and while you're finding that, I'll just uh, reemphasize what uh, Diane said, that at the beginning of the financial statements, there is the independent auditor's report that has what's uh, used to be, Diane used to be called unqualified, now it's called unmodified, un unmodified opinion, which means the same thing. Uh, that basically these statements do present fairly, in our opinion, the financial position, the results of operations of the school district for this last fiscal year. On page 50, you'll find the detail revenues and expenditures last year for, th for the three major funds of the district. And basically they're called major because of their size. And uh, those are the general fund, the debt service fund, and the capital projects fund, the end pointed out at the bottom of, of the general fund column, the $1,025,000 increase in its fund balance for the year. Uh, next to it, the debt service fund of $1.6 million increase uh, to, the, to its ending fund balance. And the capital projects fund, of course, the capital projects fund uh, receives money from uh, new bond sales and spends that on capital projects. Out of that column, you do see that you, you did have one bond issuance this last year that brought in uh, just uh, over $60 million. Uh, ending fund balance are basically unspent bond proceeds at the end of the year of $114 million total. Those are the three major funds. On page uh, 51, there is a summary column of the other couple dozen 
uh, governmental funds that are used to track uh, track district dollars. And I do want to point out a couple of those. They uh, are back beginning on page 106, further back in the report. Of course, there are three funds that you are required to illegally adopt a budget for the year, the general fund and the debt service fund, two of those major funds. The third fund is the child nutrition fund, which shows on page 106. And again, Dan pointed out uh, about $137,000 loss last year. And I'll tell you that that really is pretty good, relatively speaking, and the other districts I've been to for a district your size, uh, that loss is really smaller than what I'm seeing uh, because obviously you had to continue to pay salaries for two and a half months or so that you didn't have very little revenue coming in um, in March through May. But uh, again, there is a cap on what you can have as fund balance in that fund, which is three months worth of spending. Three months worth of 5.2 million would be about 1.3 million. Uh, you actually were bumping uh, three months a year ago, so that loss brings you down to where that million one ninety six is still uh, the majority of the three month maximum that uh, that you can have in that fund. All pages one hundred six through one hundred nine is where you'll find all the title program funds, the special ed funds, the idea B funds that come in, uh, various state funds like the IMA instructional materials allotment. Uh, page 109, just wanted to point out to you that uh, you most, all of these funds are what's called special revenue funds and that they come in basically, they come in the door already earmarked for a particular purpose. Page 109, I just wanted to point out to you that you are tracking um, in funds 481, 495, and 499 grants and donations that uh, folks in the district are able to obtain and and you see in those three funds about three hundred thousand dollars of donations and grants that came in from various sources uh some from the education foundation some just from corporate entities and uh others as well that's three hundred thousand dollars that the general fund didn't have to spend last year because uh, folks are out there soliciting grants and donations as well those are all tracked in special funds so that you know the district knows how much of those dollars are left and, and how they're being spent as well. So that, that encompasses all the governmental funds of the district. There are a few more funds that are tracked separately. And on page 112 is uh, where you'll find a couple that are uh, described as internal service funds. You are self-insured as far as workers' compensation. So that is tracked separately and you see a ending positive, uh, what's called net position, comparable to fund balance in that fund. And then a fund that started new this last year was the stadium rentals uh, coming out of the uh, completion of the, uh, the stadium renovations and rental activity that started there. So those, those are tracked separately. They're not considered governmental funds, they're considered internal service funds. And then last but not least, there are a couple other funds that are back on page 60 that are different fund types. Page 60 shows the assets and the liabilities for those. These are what are called fiduciary funds. And that name's gonna change to custodial funds next year. But uh, you see two different types here, basically some scholarship funds, scholarship trust funds that have been received and are um, managed by the district. The agency funds are the student activity funds. So for instance, student activity funds, you see almost $700,000 of student group funds that the district acts in a, a fiduciary or custodial capacity in handling those funds for those student groups. So that basically encompasses the, the funds that, uh, that are tracked in the district. A uh, couple other things I want to point out to you. Um, there are, beginning on page 
62, uh, maybe not 60, yeah, 62 are probably uh, 30 pages of, of detailed footnote disclosures that uh, give you detail about the general long-term debt that the district has, the capital assets that the district owns. There are lengthy footnotes about the two um, uh, teacher retirement related liabilities that are recorded in the consolidated statement. We'll look at the, the pension liability, the district's proportionate share of the pension liability and the health insurance liability. The one footnote I wanted to point out that's new this year is on page 89. Just wanted to point out to you that we felt like we needed to put a lengthy COVID related footnote in the report under the heading uh, risks and uncertainties. Uh, so if you didn't see that, uh, there is a disclosure in this report about that tells a little bit about what's happened as far as COVID the last uh, seven or eight months, but also just touches on the fact that the, the district has, you know, future risks and uncertainties related to ADA and um, state funding and potentially property tax valuations. Who knows what uh, what will be impacted and how much by this pandemic. Obviously nothing could be quantified. So it's just talked about in general terms here for anybody who uh, looks at this report. And then uh, lastly, in, in this report back on page 43 is this consolidated asset and liability statement that I, I need to uh, point out to you. It's called a statement of net position. It is a consolidated asset and liability statement. So all of those fund financial statements we just looked at are combined into one statement here, along with all of the capital assets the district owns, the general long-term debt that the district has, and those uh, pension and health insurance uh, estimated liabilities. And Bottom line, the main thing I wanted to point out is last two, three, four years, your your bottom line's been negative, this total net position at the bottom, which is common in virtually every decent sized school district in the state. And your bottom line actually went moved to positive this last year. You went from a four million negative to about an eight million dollar positive. Now the unrestricted net position is still a very large negative. And that's because coming out of that unrestricted are those pension and health insurance liabilities that if you added up all of the accounts on the statement related to those two things, it's about $91 million, $92 million. So even the unrestricted would be positive. The bottom line would be very much positive if we weren't required to record these actuarially estimated uh, state uh, total liabilities of uh, those two um, programs. So um, the uh, the main thing that helped out the bottom line this last year was the defeasance she did on the one bond issue. Uh, I think it was the series 2011 that you uh, made a significant um, basically down payment or prepayment on that helped out Things like that help out this bottom line net position. Uh, and in particular, it helped out the net investment and capital assets line. That's a component of that. So that's basically the highlights of this report. Along with this report, uh, what's not included in the CAFR is the single audit report. And I think you received that separately. Uh, Diane referred to one of the two additional independent auditors report letters that are in there one that basically discloses that in, in that we ran across no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal control and no non-compliance with grants rules or regulations the second independent auditors report in in that uh, document is because the district is subject to a single audit you know you receive many millions of dollars of federal funds since uh, the total is more than 750,000, we're required to basically uh, provide that document, which leads up to the 
schedule of uh, federal expenditure of uh, expenditures of federal awards that details all of those federal funds you receive and to disclose that for the programs we had to do additional compliance work on uh, which I believe was uh, was food services last year we found no non-compliance with the specific rules federal regulations that federal that food service was required to adhere to um, in uh, using their funds this last year. So that's basically the things I wanted to point out in the report. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I think I need to provide a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Recommendations for the Board of Trustees to approve the 2019-2020 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Sorry, Kyle. Do we have a recommendation? Do we have a motion? I need a motion. Back, Mindy. Thank you, Mindy. In a second. I'll Louis, second. Thank you very much. Now, any questions? Anyone? Oh, Casey? Dan, yeah, I just want to say I appreciate you uh, pulling together all these answers. So, on such short notice, by the way, we uh, I was reviewing them over the weekend and sat on for two days going over them, about 184 pages, and got the questions off, probably 20, 30 questions to you today. And I want to say I really appreciate you providing the feedback and commentary. I think you've done a very good job. And uh, just appreciate your time and all your hard work. Thank you, Casey. Any questions about the report? Your mic, Dan. I do the same thing. I'm not, getting, I'm not gonna ever get used to this. Okay, uh, your question regarding um, the reduction in recapture. So that's what happens when I just go off numbers off the top of my head because I have so many in my head. So I went back to look at um, what I had put together back when we adopted the um, 20 budget. And at that time, what we did was we compared what we would have gotten under the old law versus what we get under the new law. And I was incorrect in the recapture being uh, 10 million. So what, what it actually was, was the m &O tax collections re reduced 10 million. Um, and that was from that tax compression and our um, recapture uh, went down 14 million. So it's a bit, it was a big um, change in the recapture, but also it's offset the way that the way the state funding works is it's always, if one goes up, there's other uh, factors into that state funding, which is always tax collections, state funding and recapture. So you kind of have to look at all three of those because one impacts another. If one goes up, then this one goes down. It's kind of like, um, that's how it works. So I just wanted to clarify that with you since I had um, I told you incorrectly on the recapture. Um, it was actually tax collections went down 10 million. Our state revenue actually went down about a million. And the recapture went down 14 million. So, okay, okay. So, so then the net was like four ish or something. It was about 3 million. Three still. Okay. And to be honest, when we adopted or when we adopted the 20 budget, literally, I think. House Bill 3 was signed into law like the a couple of days before we had to adopt the budget. And so there were several pieces of the funding that honestly, just on my side, I was being conservative and didn't include them. And um, that is one of the reasons we did see a surplus um, this year um, with the reduction in state funding. So what happened was with, with uh, Corona, um, the state said, you know, they got federal money. And so what the state said is we're going to reduce school district state funding, but we're going to replace it with CARES Act. And, and they did that back in 2011 with um, uh, the um, stimulus package. And um, so what they, so because I've been so conservative and Honestly, because we had to adopt a budget before we really knew all of the final pieces. Um, we were able to just take that hit in our state funding in 20. And that's what we're using in um, 21 
to um, pay for all of our COVID expenditures. Uh, we were just able to move that federal money over. So that kind of explains the how the uh, surplus work on the. Well, thank you. I appreciate the additional color. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diane. Any other questions, comments? I have one. Becky? So, um, Diane, I've, huh, <laughs> I asked you the question, uh, how many years in a row have we achieved the award of excellence? And even I was surprised to find out um, the past 33 consecutive years. So I know you weren't around here for all of that. <laughs> Some of it, not <laughs> all of it. I know. <laughs> no, no, just like the last one or two. Um, but I'm thank honest. you. Um, thank you and your team. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you for walking us through this as you do every year um, and really making this clear and easy to understand, even when it's not always the best news or always the most fun news to get. Um, certainly seeing that positive bottom line is helpful. And, you know, we certainly wouldn't want to take out the uh, <laughs> the pension for our retired teachers. <laughs> that might be a little uh, a little detrimental. And I really do want to give credit where credit's due. Christy Drilling sitting back here. She's available for any questions that came up. But um, honestly, this is her work. And it's it's, um, it's a lot of work. So I really appreciate you reading it, Casey. That like, I want to make this feel good like someone's reading our book. <laughs> But um, it, it is a lot of information that I think is really good um, for our community to have it all in one place. And so I know it's a lot of work. Gets it done. One other thing I'd like to ask you, uh, Diane, uh, on House Bill 3, we, we got an additional $3 million. As I recall, that all went to salaries. It went to all to salaries. Plus, plus some. Plus some. I mean, yes. we more than $3 million went for a salary increase, but all the additional dollars that we received through House Bill 3 went straight to yes, South. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing them, we'll take a vote. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you again, Diane. And Carl, thank you. Thank you, thank you, for you being Carl. Here thank you. We'll move on to item H. We'll get through 19 and 19, 2019 and 2020, and we'll move on to act on the 2021-2020 school year budget planning calendar. Exactly. It's just uh, it's that time again to start the budgeting process for uh, the next time. So um, this item is not anything more than just the calendar by which we will uh, uh, approach the next few months to build the, the, the budget, uh, hopefully to uh, be considered next June. Uh, our budgets uh, go from June or from July 1 to June 30. And so uh, at the June board meeting, we consider the, uh, the budget and we have to do a lot of work from now to get to that point so that uh, uh, the board and the community can be uh, prepared to be able to uh, support that. Um, uh, budgeting decision. So this item is simply just the calendar by which we will move forward uh, and um, uh, and work on the budget. We do have several workshops uh, throughout the spring that uh, uh, where we keep the board uh, updated on our progress. Uh, and you can see the budget uh, uh, calendar is presented. Uh, the recommendations for the board trustees to approve the 2021-22 school year budget planning calendar. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I'd like to make a motion. To accept the recommendation. Accept the recommendation. Thank you. And a second. Mindy, thank you. Any questions or? And as Dr. Ryan said, we've got the dates, so make sure we get those on our on our calendar because there's a lot a lot going to happen in the next. Yeah, Lisa, I do have one question. Yes, I'm sorry, Becky. Yeah, so um, I know we had our our first yay back meeting for the Budget and Finance Committee. Um, was that just last week? Oh, gosh, I guess it was. So um, could we maybe get those dates? Because um, they're not at, they're not on here. The, yes, the I district committee. Yeah. So um, just so we kind of know where those are kind of slotting in here yes, as I well. I know it's not the the board's. Thing. It is a part of the budget process, right, yeah. so yeah, so, I can okay. add those absolutely. Thanks. I couldn't hear your your question to the uh, the dates for the budget and finance committee. The 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 yeah is not or not on here, and so it would be nice to just kind of see where they're slotted in. 
Thank you. I just didn't hear what you had to say. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carry 7 0. Move on to item I act on maximum class size exception. As the board knows, uh, we uh, have a maximum class size of 22 to 1. And if we um, go over that uh, in uh, pre K through four, we have to come to the board for um, a permission to submit a waiver. Uh, at this month, we have uh, a two. Grapevine Elementary has one second grade classroom of remote learners that has 23 students. And Silver Lake Elementary has one third grade classroom of in-person learners that has 23 students. So we'll be submitting uh, for your uh, approval a request for maximum class size exception in accordance with state law. Um, uh, the recommendation is for the board trustees to approve the request for maximum class size exception for one second grade classroom at Grapevine Elementary and one third grade classroom at Silver Lake Elementary. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? Jesse? Yes, yeah. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation, please. Thank you, Jesse. In a second. Casey, a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? <laughs> Seeing, I know. Seeing none. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Very proud of you, Becky. Very proud of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Bring me around. Casey, she normally doesn't vote for those. So, since, but COVID is a big exception. Uh, we'll move on to item J um, reallocate 2005 bond funds for flooring to replace the wooden ramps and stairs with aluminum ramps and stairs. Dr. Ryan? We have several facilities around the school district that uh, uh, have wooden uh, staircases, and um, it's time to uh, work on those uh, in a pretty significant way. So, Paula, would you like to just take us briefly through this item, please? Certainly, Dr. Ryan. Um, the nine areas are, are listed in your packet agenda on page, uh, well, 76 in mine anyway. Um, these are primarily the portable buildings, and we have one pier and beam wooden constructed building uh, finally called the GCISD White House, which is right outside of this building. As you know, that's typically where we have staff um, office. We use the Language Acquisition Center over by between uh, Timberline and the JPS Clinic. That's another one of these facilities that we're talking about. Um, at least seven of the nine, we know that these ramps and stairs are well over 20 years. They're certainly showing that when you can see the rotting wood and the sagging, despite treatments and painting and, and repairs and replacement pieces that have been done over the years. Um, and so in the 2005 bond, there remains a line item that was specifically for flooring replacement um, at campuses and at different facilities. It has about $424,000 left in that particular line. Um, while you walk on ramps and stairs, that's very similar to flooring. It's not exactly flooring in the way that that bond committee probably thought about. And so we bring those kinds of requests to you. That is to reallocate a portion of that funds. We estimated about 150,000 based on the seven sites that the facility services department has actually uh, sought proposals for. They need to do that for the other two, which would be replaced later um, within the next year or two, if you will. So that's the reason for the recommendation and where the funding source um, is coming from. Dr. Thank, thank you, Paula. The recommendation is for the board trustees to approve the reallocation of $150,000 of the 2005 bond funds for flooring to replace the wooden ramps and stairs at nine locations. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion that we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation for the replacement of the ramp for 150,000. Thank you, Louie, in a second. Mindy, I've got Mindy. Thank you, Mindy. Any questions? For Paula. Becky? Yeah, Paula, so I know you mentioned that, um, um, that, uh, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Becky, with sorry. the microphone. Thank you. Um, I know you said one of these, oh, my board book is really slow, is going to be need to be done soon, but you're going to do all these at one time, right? I mean, you may as well get them all the same age so they're a little easier to kind of track. 
Uh, depending on the pricing that comes in, yes, the goal is definitely to do seven of them uh, and probably do that sometime this summer, if not sooner. There, there are a couple that are in worse shape than even some of the others, despite their age. Um, and we're the one at transportation. We're really waiting to find out exactly where the new driveway and parking lot will be. We don't want to do that twice, depending on where it's located. So we may hold a little bit on that until we know specifically where it's going to. If it gets to stay exactly where it is, then we can proceed. So that's the reason for a little bit of a delay there. Becky and I had some conversations about this today, and we thought a zip line from the White House to the admin building would be nice. But Becky thought you would think there was a liability issue there. Yes, ma'am, I would. You're you're right, Becky. <laughs> I, I can build a zip line really well. I've, I've built some. It would some. be cheaper. I mean, you know. Jess, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, Paula. Now you mentioned nine. Is that the total? number throughout the district we're only looking at nine uh the nine places where we have wooden ramps and stairs going to the portable buildings or the white house yes sir okay all right thank you thank you jesse any other questions seeing none all those in favor motion carry seven zero move on to item K, approve the use of the 2011 bond allocation for critical emergency capital improvements to replace the fire sprinkler heads at Grapevine Middle School. Dr. Ryan? Yes, this is uh, certainly a safety issue as pointed out uh, by our fire officials in the city of Grapevine. Paula, uh, could you add some uh, information to this item, please? Yes, sir. First off, in the 2011 bond, we do have an allocation that the board made for critical emergency capital improvements. Uh, this is a good example of something that is not necessarily anticipated, although we do know when these things need to be expected. These are not the type of thing that we can budget in the operating budget. Um, and so you have that particular line item in the 2011 bond. Our, our understanding was always that we would come to the board and make you aware of how that money was going to be spent specifically for those types of projects. So in this particular case, we had the typical um, inspection, which is not unusual. What is unusual is to actually have a sprinkler head that fails the sensitivity uh, testing. Um, and that's done by an independent lab that's sent off somewhere else to be done. And one of two mechanisms worked, but the other one did not. And unfortunately, um, that, may, that provides the requirement that we have to replace all that were of the same model. So as you saw there, uh, that's 1,100 sprinkler heads that need to be replaced um, at a at a significant cost, that would be a, a big hit for the facility services department. Again, that's not something that they have budgeted for that. I, I will tell you that after this expenditure, if you approve it, uh, that will leave us actually uh, $54,256 in that particular line item. So um, I can anticipate that we will bring forward a recommendation to you in the future to reallocate some funds to, to bring that back up to a, a typical level. As you know, we just spend it down with your approval to to this point, um, we had to do the uh, fire alarm system at the swim center and this one most recently. Those are the two that you probably remember most recently. Dr. Ryan. Thank you, Paula. The recommendations for board trustees to approve the use of thirty seven thousand four hundred dollars of the 2011 bond allocation for critical emergency capital improvements to replace specified fire sprinkler heads at Grapevine Middle School. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I move that we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you, Mindy. In a second. Jorge, thank you very much. Any questions? I have a question. Mindy? Do we have these same sprinkler heads, similar age, similar in any of our other campuses, or do we not want to go down that hmm. pole? No, <laughs> I can't tell you specifically if we, if we have the same model and brand. I, I have seen a spreadsheet where they do track the age because um, you have to do this with, with routine. However, you could have a sprinkler head that's been in your facility 30 years and has not failed. So just to be clear on that, it's just a continuous uh, reinspection, if you will. There are sectors that require you to inspect at 10 years. That's something that's always looked at. Um, I am aware, for example, that at the swim center due to the previous, well, and you're always going to have somewhat of a corrosive nature uh, with chlorine in the air. Uh, there are some sprinklers there 
that our own fire technician ha has noted are corroded. He's uncomfortable with that. They have not failed. They passed inspection, as a matter of fact, in August. Um, but we will probably get, they're probably getting a proposal to seek to replace those uh, at some point. One of the problems is, of course, you have to take the entire system offline. You have to pressure test it when you bring it back online. So it's not not just a quick overnight kind of process. Sure. Thank you very much. Great question, Mindy. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Jesse? Yeah, and uh, Paula, Paula, to that point, is this uh, something that automatically happens at all our campuses, the, these inspections of uh, the sprinkler heads on a, on a regular basis? Yes, there are annual inspections that are performed uh, not only by our independent contractor, but also the city fire marshal uh, make their own inspections. Uh, but as you saw in the requirements there by ordinance, there's certain uh, time periods at which you then pull sprinkler heads and send them off for testing, which is what was done at, at Grapevine Middle School. So that is not necessarily an annual item uh, per se, but those okay, are yeah. looked at as part, part of the working system. Okay, and then as far as uh, the time frame to replace these uh, sprinkler heads, if indeed, uh, you know, we're going to do this, how soon would that occur and, and um, you know, for that to be taken care of? Um, we, have to, we have to have approval of this first. Uh, they will be notifying upon approval, they will be notifying the vendor in the morning uh, that we're, we're funded and we're able to move forward. And then they will set a time and course for for the work at Grapevine Middle School. I don't know if this is something that can be done over winter break, for example, where we have approximately two weeks. It may depend on their schedule, um, but we will proceed as quickly as we can. And, and then do we do they have do we know whether they have the inventory to to replace because I think you mentioned quite a, a, a number. Yes, 1100 sprinkler heads. Um, I don't know if they have inventory, but I haven't noticed that that's something that we've. We've had delayed in construction projects, for example, per se, but we've not been replacing a lot of sprinkler heads. Okay. <clears throat> those Thank are you. those Thank are you. things we have to get. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jesse. Any other questions? Casey? Yeah, yeah, one question. Yeah. Has this um, been an issue throughout the district and all of our other schools, or, or is this kind of a one-off issue where we have 1,100 sprinkler heads? This is a one-off issue. Do we know the vendor that installed them, or is it the vendor's fault, or is it just faulty equipment? I, I think it's probably just age and time. Um, it's been 20 years for those sprinkler uh, heads per se, um, but I, I don't have the specific name and, and brand. I know they do have that information. They do have the information of the specific sprinkler head? I, I believe that they would, yes. Okay. Yeah, I would recommend that hopefully our, our vendor that we use to get to replace it maybe give us some assurances that it's good good equipment and probably not going to be 1,100 sprinkler heads going default on us in five more years or 20 more years. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Jorge? Well, I guess there's some sort of code that forces us to replace all those sprinklers just because one failed. Yes, sir. Okay. It is a, a part of the uh, National Fire Protection Association, and I believe some of the uh, specific provisions are in the in the packet where it calls for you to do that when you have one, even one failure uh, to have to replace all that are of the similar age and brand, which is what we're doing here. So it's no way to, I mean, you, you could test 20 of those and they, if they're not faulty, they'll still force you to do it. Yes. Wow. Okay. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's not a safety issue for our students or school. It's just that one didn't work. One didn't work. And honestly, I mean, the fuse link actually worked. What, what happened is the head didn't spin and disperse the water in a circular motion. And you need that coverage for each one. And I mean, they're all based and, and put out uh, exactly at a, social, a specific distance and they need to be able to cover their distance. It At just amazes me. I understand, but that you can't replace the one that's broken. Is that a statewide or is that a city? Does well, the city well, make their own a ordinance? National or recommendation that was national. adopted by okay. the city. Okay. And that's why I specifically quoted it. Thank you. Because I asked the same questions. 
Any other question? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. That is the end of our action items. The remainder are information only. So we'll move on to item L uh, review summer school programs. Yes, we uh, are going to hear a report tonight of our summer school programs from last summer, which of course was a very different uh, summer school uh, type of uh, situation because of COVID. Uh, with us tonight, we have uh, uh, Tiffany Cunningham, who is our Director of Student Services, uh, and she uh, is new to her role uh, after joining us uh, from her job as an administrator at uh, Grayvon High School. So welcome to Tiffany. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing about uh, our summer programs from this past summer. Tiffany. Good evening, Dr. Ryan, Board of Trustees and the GCISD family. Tonight, you will hear from leaders in our district who were charged with planning summer school, as you just mentioned, like none before, via the virtual platform amidst the early chaos of the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to them, the teachers, and the staff for their hard work and their persistence as the new coordinator of summer school going forward. So given the guidance and the circumstances surrounding the state of school design, during the early phases of the pandemic, it was strategically decided to move forward with the following four programs in an effort to continue to provide academic support to our students with identified needs. Dream Camp was led by elementary assistant principals Daniela Alvarez from Timberline Elementary and Lisa Brown from Canlan Elementary, who will be sharing tonight as well. Dyslexia was led by Ms. Amy Montemayor, coordinator of interventions, and Sydney and Cindy Felker, literacy intervention teacher leader. Eighth grade boot camp was led by then GHS associate principal, Mr. Michael Crow, who now serves as a middle school principal in Keller ISD. Secondary summer school was led by HMS assistant principal, Dr. Jeff Mishu, and GHS associate principal, Ted Woolman. So eighth grade star math and reading camp was offered June 8th through the 19th. And each day, 30 students synchronously attended two hour classes if they took one class and four hours if they took two classes via WebEx. Both reading and math sessions were offered in the morning from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. and in the afternoons from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m and were either led by the math or reading teacher. Reading sessions were divided into three sections and class was opened and they completed vocabulary and fluency work via platforms such as Kahoot, Gimlet, and Quizlet. And students then completed independent work via a student app and then the lessons were wrapped up with reading activities targeted with comprehension and reading strategies. For math, the students completed whole group and individualized work. They utilized the IXL program to review and practice um, some of the hardest eighth grade math texts, which include solving equations, linear equations, geometry, real number operations, and ordering. And so now we will hear more about Dream Camp. So Dream Camp is our program for elementary school students. And of course, this is where we house our state required language academy. So for that, we went ahead and invited all of our pre-K and English language learners from across the district. And the students who accepted the invitation were able to receive 3.5 hours of instruction four days a week. Two and a half of these hours were face-to-face -face instruction via WebEx. Um, one hour was for math, one hour, was, one hour was for reading, and the students also received an additional 30 minutes of foundation uh, foundations, one of the programs our district uses um, with an expert teacher to really solidify some of those early literacy skills that we knew our students would need headed into this year. And on that picture, you can see one of our sweet students working on her letters um, with her teacher. And then we can go on to the next slide, Tiffany. For first through fifth graders, we used our middle of the year data to invite students who were in need of reading or math intervention. These students received three hours of instruction four days a week from our own GCISD certified teachers. Um, some of that time was spent on a new program that the district purchased last year, Fast Forward, which is meant to develop language. And it was a good introduction for our teachers and good introduction for the students. We had a total of 27 staff members who worked at some point or another during Dream Camp. 
And it was really our teachers first dive into synchronous instruction at the elementary level. It involved a lot of trial and error, and we are so proud of them for the way they worked to really um, overcome some hurdles and really reach out to our students. And we believe our parents were pleased with what they experienced with this virtual program. Tiffany, you there? Yes, I'm going out. We're with Ms. Lisa Brown. Okay. I know I saw Lisa a few moments ago, and then I haven't, then she might have dropped off. Kyle, is Lisa around? I don't know if we can hear Lisa. Lisa, I will I will jump ahead with your information if that's okay with you. Um, on this slide, um, you will see our attendance numbers. We served a total of 203 students during Dream Camp. This was a nine week session. It was the longest summer program that we have offered in, in recent memory, and it was three three week sessions. And families were able to select how many sessions they signed up for. Um, and you can see the breakdown on the screen by which students came, what grade level, what session. Um, but we were pleased with the attendance. Of course, at the end of the summer, it kind of drops off. People were a little bit fatigued, but um, we had very good attendance and people who had signed up for maybe just one session who came back and asked if they could do two and three. And we have just one more slide for you just to share some data. Um, one of the things that we were able to implement this year, um, thank you, Amy Montemayor, who's on the screen. She really helped with this was to be able to use our universal screener Ames web to really gather some information about how our students were performing after their summer school intervention. So you'll see those numbers um, on your screen. We tested some different areas in some of the different grade levels, um, some basic concepts down in the lower grades, and then oral reading fluency and reading comprehension in the upper grades. And what we found when we compared this data to the data of who attended how many sessions, really our kids who attended two and three sessions, they were the ones who showed the growth. So that's why you see a lot of those numbers are around between the 60 and 70%, which really leads us to think, you know, six weeks is the sweet spot, at least for seeing growth for our students during summer sessions. Okay, so moving into dyslexia summer school and um, the past couple of summers, we offered dyslexia summer school through our enrichment program. And so it was more a time for students to um, review um, what they had learned the prior year in dyslexia intervention. Um, but due to COVID um, and the thankfulness of leadership allowing us to move forward, um, we were able to serve 118 of our students um, that were currently in dyslexia intervention and continue on with their dyslexia lessons for three weeks during the summer. So that was a third of our students um, that participated. Prior to that, in enrichment summer school where parents paid, um, we had probably about 25 or 30 per, um, students participate. And we had 13 interventionists um, that continued their work um, past the school year during the summer with our students in dyslexia intervention that attended summer school. Moving on to uh, secondary summer school, thanks to leadership, we were allowed to complete a one session of virtual summer school this summer in two uh, platforms. The first platform was uh, synchronous instruction for initial credit and for middle school students needing to recover core content credit and an asynchronous instruction for high school credit recovery. So just like in Dream Camp, this was a trial run for synchronous instruction and how that would run. Moving to the next slide, 
you see just some participation and results there. 46 high school students were able to recapture 75 credit recovery courses. This is using the Edgenuity software credit recovery programs that most high school students are familiar with. It allows a lot of students to stay on track to graduate. And exams were offered through uh, WebEx office hours with the teachers. 34 middle school students were able to recover core content classes using credit recovery synchronous learning platforms offered in the morning and the afternoon. And then when you look at the last two bullet points, you're looking at really the bread and butter of secondary summer school. And these are the students that are trying to gain initial credit. And they are, you see the high school students, a lot of them taking 222 initial credit courses through synchronous learning platforms. They're logging into mandatory WebExes and participating in activities, checking in with their teachers in office hours. And also the 152 middle school students that are uh, advancing and going quickly, working on building some time in their high school, uh, um, high school schedules in order to take something like a CTE course or an advanced course in high school. So these are your health, speech, government, and um, touch system students. Turn it over to Mr. Willman, who will finish off the summer school program. Good evening. All of our STAR tests were postponed due to COVID-19. So we did not, uh, did not uh, take or do any of our STAR retesting throughout the summer. Uh, but we did have 46 students uh, that completed middle school bridge math and science courses. That was quite an accomplishment. And on June 20th of 2020, four students met graduation requirements and received their diplomas. All right, thank you. And so last but not least, just looking at our, our budget and our expenditures due to some of the things that we took off due to COVID, there was a surplus there. And on that note, we will ask if there are any questions. Thank you all very much. Do we have any questions for any of them? Becky. Yeah, so, um, and I kind of already broached this topic with um, Dr. Ryan. So when I was on the uh, TASB conference call with the commissioner, he's, uh, he's pushing pretty hard the idea of the intercessional, intercessional calendar, meaning um, taking advantage of the opportunity to um, extend the school year for some students into the summer. Um, so y'all saw that about six weeks, it, would you say that's the maximum or the sweet spot? What, um, you know, what, what were y'all seeing there as far as what we could take advantage of for kind of what, I guess, TEA, I didn't, there's not jargon they haven't met that they don't like. Apparently they're calling them priority students now. Um, so can y'all talk a little bit more about, um, what you see opportunities that we could do, maybe do things a little bit different, um, particularly with the potentiality for some funding from TEA. And I'm gonna jump in. Oh, I'm sorry, Daniela, you can go ahead. Go ahead, Tiffany. Okay, so um, in terms of the sweet spot for um, the littles or for our dream camp, we, we thought that um, nine weeks was a little bit extensive. So this year we were thinking about looking at possibly um, the six weeks, knowing that um, right now we, we, we don't really know um, in terms of, of where we wanna go with that. But I think um, the more, the better in a sense. But again, we don't have the, the data just yet to say that that's the best choice on that. Is that your question? Anyone, any other trustees have a, and I can't see Jess, Jesse. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, Tiffany, uh, regarding the, the, I think you said what dream camp, what are the thoughts in terms of, uh, well, not only the dream camp, but these other programs moving forward for the summer? Are you all starting to look in terms of, of what that, those programs will look like, whether we're in person or virtual? Have we, have we looked at that? Absolutely, that's on the task list for coming up. Uh, the goal is to look at what it may look like if we were to be in person and then also have the virtual option too. 
So we are in the beginning phases um, of trying to figure out what that's going to look like for next year. But those are thoughts that we are definitely considering at this point. Okay, so if you had, if you had some students that this past summer went through the dream camp, and you identified those youngsters, as you move forward into this next year, do you know whether those same youngsters will end up being in some of those classes again, or is our success rate so high that those youngsters are not repeaters? I'm just I'm trying to get a, a, a picture in terms of of are we able to see growth? And then is that growth sustainable? And is it scalable? So that's that's why I was asking that. So we don't know that yet, but we do have um, lots of information that we are able to track. And that's one of the great things about the students being able to do the Ames web testing this summer is that that data is already with their home campuses. Teachers are already seeing that they were working during the summer. So that would be really interesting actually to see you know, how many of our kids maintained what they learned and did that give them the boost they needed going into this grade level? Absolutely. Okay, that, that's kind of where I was headed with that. So I'm, 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 I'm glad and very pleased to hear your response to that. So thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Any other questions? None. Seeing none, thank you all for staying up, so staying with us so long and late. We appreciate that and we appreciate the report. So thank you all very much. If I could also thank them um, for their work during the summer. That's yes, when, that that's is so true. I'm sorry that everybody yeah. is not working, but uh, certainly uh, uh, Jeff and Ted and Tiffany and Daniela and Lisa and Amy uh, and the teachers that they've hired and all the all the different people that it takes to do this. This is a, a pretty quick report and it and it demonstrates that there's a lot of work that had to happen. Uh, but that it happened not only uh, during the summer, but in the middle of a pandemic uh, during the summer when we didn't and they had to retool everything that they were doing. And so um, I just want to say thank you for your efforts and and uh, 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 kids are in a better place academically because of the work that you did with them this summer. So thank you very much. We will move on to item M, review owner contingency expenditures. Dr. Ryan. Uh, yes, you can see uh, the report of the owner contingency expenditures from our projects this month. And if you have any questions, we'll uh, try to address them. We have any questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to item N, uh, updated 2016 bond program. Yeah, things are uh, slowing a little bit in this world at this point. And so uh, Gary is with us to kind of take us through um, where we are. So Gary, welcome. So as Gary is bringing the, uh, the presentation up for tonight, I'll just I'll let you know um, one of the things that you asked was to again see some before and after pictures of the learning commons, which is primarily what we have in the in the update. And as you know, a significant feature of the 2016 bond was to convert that space into a space of multi use spaces and to kind of create a different environment in their learning environment for the students. Um, and so that uh, was achieved is called out by the strategic plan and the bond itself. And then as we begin renovating those spaces, we heard from students uh, telling us how much more they enjoyed the learning commons uh, preferred to be in them. Now it's it was considered cool to go hang out in there and work on their projects um, or work individually in those spaces. And so the last of those were completed uh, in the 2020 uh, period. The other thing you're gonna see is just some of the equipment updates that we made to the vestibules at these campuses, all but one uh, had a vestibule already. Uh, basically they were updated with equipment to kind of align them with uh, the newer vestibules that we brought online in 2019. Uh, when we, you know, renovated spaces to create those at the campuses that didn't have it. And then and Gary will have a little bit of a preview of the kind of the highlights, if you will, of the 2021 work uh, that will be coming up uh, beginning in June of this year um, for, for 2021. So, Gary, you ready? Okay. Awesome. I think we are. Thank you, Paula. Good evening, trustees. Dr. Ryan, it's good to be back with you again uh, this month. And uh, we'll... Uh, it's kind of a fun update tonight uh, as we uh, get to look at pictures more than bullet points and kind of talk about down and dirty, nitty gritty things. Really, this is the result of, of all that and a lot of hard work by your contractors and your staff uh, as well. So we'll take you through 
Um, as, as Paula mentioned, we'll take you through the elementary campuses. Uh, if you recall, Bear Creek will start off um, really at the control vestibule, has quite a, quite a large area anyway, so really no architectural work was done here. Um, the technology piece was the primary function here for safety security. So you see the kiosks and the two-way camera uh, security systems that are all in place and are working well. I will say I had to go back uh, this week and take a few pictures, and so they work really well, actually. So um, got scanned and temperatured four times uh, the other day, So um, and they work well. So uh, moving into the learning commons, we wanted to show you really uh, months and months ago what, what was. Uh, you see some of the, um, really the back then, the high efficiency T8 lights, uh, fluorescent light fixtures, a little bit lower ceilings, two by two ceilings, um, really nice in there. And then we showed you some renderings of really what it could be. Uh, so we really went from here to dreaming a little bit and showing you what it could be. I showed you a couple of shots here as we as we looked at ceilings and different areas of that of that space. And then here are some of the after shots. So you see a lot of the, in the ceilings, a little bit higher ceilings, some uh, bulkheads that have different colors, LED light fixtures, really add some pretty dynamic, um, uh, dynamic things to the space here. And so picture on the right shows a little bit of uh, the, we call, they call the genius bar or just some areas. Actually, they've got a book fair going on here at, at Bear Creek. So we captured some of that. Um, another couple of shots here, you'll notice some of the mobile furniture. You'll see this as, as pretty common throughout throughout these campuses and, and really the districts in packages pass. So uh, really a fun space um, with the lighting and some ceiling grids and furnishings, et cetera. So um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there weren't a lot of students in here when I got the chance to go after after school. So wanted to kind of capture the, the spaces um, as they are. And so you can see some of the various um, collab spaces, the little uh, blue room on the left there um, for video and small group instruction as well. And then really just to, find, just to finish out the Bear Creek campus um, video room on the far right. And then just again, some of the, some of the maker spaces and collab spaces that, that are in that, in that space. At Bransford Elementary, the before shots were, were really just, again, no architectural work really per se, more of uh, safety security with the, the two-way camera system um, and the kiosks there as you, as you check in and out uh, of the campus. You see they have, uh, also they've got a, quite a large space there, so there really was not um, intrusive or anything like that, and it's really easy to get to and, and get in and out through there. So. Um, again, a before shot of Bransford Learning Commons, what that, what that looked like with the large uh, circulation desks and uh, low ceilings and T8 fluorescent fixtures, a couple of renderings prior to uh, starting. You can see really what those, those large spaces really look like now. Uh, LED fixtures, new paint, new carpet, uh, mobile furniture, furniture, et cetera. So, um, Really, these are pretty dynamic spaces. If you haven't had a chance to walk through, though, they're they're phenomenal spaces, and getting used quite quite a bit. So, both of those campuses, they were able to create those uh, notched out nooks, uh, similar to what was introduced at Cannon Elementary School when, when it was built. Yeah, you can see those on the on that right hand side picture, primarily in a little closer shot here. So those are great spaces for the kids just to crawl into and read a book and. And really to socialize with each other. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, the little octagons when it can't. Yeah, I can't really fit in the well. <laughs> I shouldn't. Let's just say that. Um, at Heritage Elementary School, again, uh, good size room there for our area as you enter the building for the controlled vestibule and controlled access into the school three kiosks and the two-way security camera systems uh, at this campus as well. And again, a shot here of the interior of what used to be at Heritage and a couple of renderings uh, really early on, very similar to Bransford. Um, and then here's a couple of shots of what that looks like today, really getting a lot of use out. And it's interesting to watch from commons to commons, the different layouts of the mobile bookshelves and furniture and different things that people do differently. And even throughout the day, how much those things move. 
which is really, really exactly what, uh, what you guys were after. So very flexible, uh, very usable space. Um, and again, some more little reading areas here on the right as well. So those LED fixtures are um, pretty phenomenal because they've got the, the range and you can lower and uh, raise the light levels to, to whatever you're doing in various parts of those learning commons as well. So a lot of, lot of flexibility as well. <clears throat> At Colleyville Elementary School, the, the uh, entrance uh, here, the controlled entrance, we added one uh, security camera and uh, access control system here. Um, the learning commons, a little, again, a little, little fresher look, a little newer campus than the others. So there's a little bit uh, less to do, but still a, a pretty good impact here on the renderings. Did a lot of ceiling work, new lights. Uh, some new flooring, some painting. You can see on the left, kind of before, what that looked like, one of those little areas, and then on the right, how much that opened up um, and really just adds a, another dimension to that space. And again, another another shot here with some flexible seating and tables, um, really doing a good job of, of that. Some, some breakout spaces adjacent to the learning commons there on the left and right uh, in the film room. So those place, those spaces are getting quite a bit of use as well. So. <clears throat> and at Colleyville Heritage High School, uh, if you recall, the picture on the left, a couple of before pictures, shows the entrance uh, storefront a little further back within that, that, that brick entrance there. And you can see on the right, really, the, the space that was there. And then hard to see really on the left, but we pulled that storefront all the way out. And then on the right, you can really get a an impact of what, how much larger that space is. And so really a minimal dollar amount for a huge impact. And so you see the three kiosks there and uh, two-way security cameras, et cetera. So really a nice, a nice space there. Yeah, there were a lot of leaves in there. <laughs> it was really windy that day. Um, and then a couple of renderings here at the Tech Hub and the Learning Commons, um, which kind of shows you how how much this space really has changed. A um, little bit of older uh, lighting system, bulkheads and stuff on the left. Um, heavy furniture, you know, just that real heavy wood chairs and furniture. And then on the right, really a lot of a lot of flexibility. Um, lighting again, LED light fixtures. <clears throat> you see some of the the spaces that were closed in offices and a workroom and different things like that and how those spaces just opened up for more collaboration, more really socialization in those rooms. So it's really a, a, a pretty dynamic effect there. Almost looks like the rendering. Almost looks like, yes. The rendering, yeah. <laughs> That's live. Yeah. And they are they are happy to show this off. <laughs> They're very proud of this space. So uh, furniture turned out really, really nice as well. As Paula mentioned, I won't read all this. We're just uh, pretty excited about the 2021 projects that are getting ready to, to we're actually in quality control. And so they'll go out to bid mid-January. Uh, mid um, really just wanted to hit some of the highlights here. Again, the bond program or the uh, presentation is on the bond program website. Uh, but the campuses that will be affected here would be the transportation facility, facility services, the shops that are adjacent to those, the material storage, et cetera, uh, the large warehouse administration building, some minor drainage work here, and then the portables around this campus here uh, will be affected. And really at a high level, just some um, ADA upgrades, maybe a little bit of painting and some, some security uh, items. Uh, again, ECDC will we'll uh we'll see some some renovations here to uh to to help with the capacity uh there as well pdec will get some minor renovations um bridges and vista as well so really this will round out the bond program and turn in these this last package really is the is most of it's the non-educational side of this but very very important as well to the to the finishing up of the bond program so 
Um, and cross timbers, we've talked about it in, in a couple of months past. We're we're getting closer to, the, to addressing the, the drainage at Cross Timbers and then the channel improvements at Bear Creek. And so uh, next month, I'll have a little bit more information for you there, but that is that's continuing. I mentioned the transportation center. I just wanted to touch on this. This is on the bottom of this schematic is, is really the Northern part of that transportation bus, bar, bus area. And the proposal is to go North and a little bit East Again, this is very schematic. We're just trying to lay that out. We've got a couple of meetings uh, this week, and one with Manny, and, and we're gonna talk about numbers and spaces and turn radiuses and different things like that. So it's a very schematic um, uh, layout right now. So I'll have much, much more and more, you know, hard, hard drawings to, to show you on the next month. So if I could add on this, um, you know, in 2015, when the bond program was put together, um, the district didn't own transit buses, and now we have six. They're two and a half feet longer than any of the other buses that we have. Um, and the idea now in trying to lay this out has become a little bit more challenging, uh, trying to keep the, the uh, track and field events that exist um, to the north and east of that area. Uh, it may be that we have to move one of the discus um, and change the direction in which it's oriented so it's not facing the buses itself in the parking lot should we have an errant throw mm -hmm. of some type. So a, a few nuances that might not have been anticipated in 2015 that we're just, we're just trying to work through and literally they've been measuring out spaces um, down there and, and the, the folks, you know, the consultants are coming out to do the same to try to figure out because when the tail of that must turns it's it's very different than your vehicle even with the largest suv and you can wipe out a lot of things uh left and right so uh they're still working through that that's why this is kind of at the, the schematic level if you will um uh but that is essentially the only space and the only direction in which we can take the the parking lot to uh to be adjacent so it's you know a, a driveway there behind the field house if you're familiar with that area up into that um, into that space where you've seen track and field events, in particular for the Special Olympics, uh, if you think about uh, that area. You might have noticed in the update uh, in the past week and mentioned uh, a couple of challenges on long lead time items. That's something we continue to work on with uh, Lee Lewis, our general contractor. Uh, we may have to, to bring some things out of order and ahead of setting the guaranteed maximum price for those projects, just to make sure that we we don't have a challenge and not a long lead time per se in terms of getting the items, but we know that the review of the fire alarm system we anticipate will be required for the ECDC uh, will take longer than it will to actually do the work itself. So that's probably one of those that we'll, we'll bring out of order once we're directed that that has to be uh, replaced and done in that facility. And uh, I think I'd mentioned things like light poles and light fixtures, which are a big part of the transportation parking lot. Uh, the bond calls obviously to put light poles in the new parking lot, but also to upgrade the fixtures in the existing lot to LED. That'll be a, another, you know, eventual savings as far as our utility expenses are concerned and, uh, and a couple of other items. So uh, we'll be working on those, keep you updated. One of the other things um, that we didn't mention here, but is something that's already being looked at is the upgrades to the elementary playgrounds themselves and the structures. Um, if you recall during that process, there's a certain amount of money that was requested. It was reduced several times. Eventually it became just an allowance uh, with direction to the district to do what you can when you get to that time. And uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone on in the last year in trying to figure out where our playground structures themselves are, because uh, a number of them are really 25 to 30 years old and you can't get parts for them. That was part of this uh, upgrade. But one of the things that's also come about are changes uh, that require accessibility that doesn't necessarily exist on a parity level at some of our campuses. Uh, so um, Huckabee's consultant is obviously gonna help us assess uh, what accessible pathways we need to incorporate into, into um, our playgrounds at the elementary area. So that's other work that's ongoing in, in terms of thinking about uh, work that will happen in 2021. Any, is that it? That'll do it. Do we have, have any, any questions? questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You have something, Becky? Well, it's not so much a question, it's just a comment. Um, I'm very glad that the 2015 bond committee uh, was able to have the kind of vision that they did because, you know, we could not have imagined the need for those libraries to turn into such usable, flexible spaces in a time like this. Um, it is not unusual for me to get um, uh, or my kids to get an email to say, hey, you know, my class today is being moved into the library because we need more space to spread out. And we're, we're incredibly fortunate. And then, you know, the transit buses, um, UIL realigns us every two years. And, you know, this is the second time now that we've found um, Grapevine and Heritage in two different alignments. And you never know where UIL is gonna stick you and how far you're gonna have to go. And um, we're just really fortunate that, that those things were able to happen. Um, I can just maybe kind of give a little bit of update. So when I was watching that um, Senate education hearing, one of the things that was brought up, and I mean, uh, trust, uh, trustees, superintendents from um, Carn City and Aldine and Garland, um, Dallas, uh, a number of, of school districts across state were represented on that. And one of the things that they were talking about in this update was both the need um, to hear about the virtual experience out there. And then the additional part of the hearing was on House Bill 3906, which is the move of the STAR test to the virtual environment only. And one of the things that uh, the chairman, Senator Taylor, brought up was the fact that um, there will be now ongoing device needs on a cyclical basis. One of the things that he did not mention was how to fund that. So um, I, I think that we were really, really fortunate, not only from the preparedness perspective to deal with the COVID situation that we find ourselves in, but also looking ahead to what the state is mandating for star testing. And I guarantee you the commissioner is not backing down on administering star tests this, this spring, that we're in a much, much better position than so many other school districts. So There's I no appreciate just the infrastructure itself and what yes. Kyle's team has been working on with their contractors. Yeah, uh, basically what you don't see that powers everything and making sure that the highway we're all using every day is big enough for the amount of traffic that we're suddenly pushing through on a daily basis. Yeah, it it was it was a both enlightening and kind of scary hearing, but also reassuring that um, that 2015 bond committee and then the voters were were smart enough to take care of us then. So thank you, Gary. Those look really good. I heard from a number of parents down at Bear Creek. They're really excited to hear about that project going forward. And I know it's not a classroom and it's not a fun, fancy, cool project, but just like the, the issue over here between the high school and cross timbers, we've got to get that done. So I, they were happy to hear that That's it was nice. finally, finally yeah. going to happen. Well, nice. And I do want to remind us though, that that's not in the scope of the bond. The, the erosion of the channel was not something that's there and that's something the city's requiring us. So I'm, I'll be coming forward with a plan for how we can take care of that out of the 16 bond. Yeah, Becky, it's 2016 bond. And as the co-chair of that, I'll make sure Shea Kirkman, Ian Mooney, Paula Barbaro, and the 300 stakeholders that worked on it for about a year and a half and presented that $248 million bond package are told thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember standing up here in front of you and presenting. Oh. Uh, but yeah, it, I mean, who would have known that what we had done with these learning commons and, you know, we were talking, everybody was talking about, you know, some of the bigger items and the escalation cost of everything. And here we are. And, you know, we've had learning commons done at some of the schools in the first year, you know, at Heritage Middle, I mean, Heritage Middle School, and here we are getting it done and the safety and security. It's amazing what Huckabee and Gary's team, I mean, they came in and worked with us side by side. It's just amazing where we're at with that money that we have gotten and that our voters approved, you know, as a school board of trustees, we call for the election, but it's not us, it's the voters. And if I'm not mistaken, that passed 64% and now they're getting to enjoy the benefits of it and what we're getting to enjoy in this community, because we are still, because of that bond and the previous ones has made this a destination school district. 
And that's why our property values keep going up because people want to live here because of what we can provide for our community, for our teachers, for our students, and for our employers. So thanks, Gary, for everything you did. And it's always nice to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're in design phases and we're passing the, the budget and so forth, but when you can touch it, feel it, see it, and enjoy it, that's a reward. And thanks for helping us get there. Thank you. Really appreciate you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for staying late, Gary. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. always. Well, <laughs> you're always the last one to go on. It's always late. So okay. we appreciate we appreciate you very much. It's, it's good to be here. Any other questions for him so we can go home? Nope. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. We'll see you, you next month. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> At 10 o'clock. I'll just stay here. Yeah. <laughs> we'll move on to item O. review the 2020 2021 board planning calendar. This was only one item that changed on the board planning calendar. That's the middle and high school course selection guide. We should be ready to bring that to the board in December. Uh, didn't make it in November. That's the only change. I will say we also moved team of eight to January, correct? We did move it. I, I, didn't, okay. I didn't know exactly how okay. we settled on. Um, any questions? Move on to item P, request uh, for reports to the board. Do I have any requests for reports? Seeing none. Move on to consent agenda for approval. We have anything to be pulled or our motion? Oh, I'm sorry, Jesse. I keep forgetting to look at the screen. <laughs> yes, I, I'd like to pull item G, please. G is in George. Is in I'm sorry, did you say G or J? G, G. is George. I thought he said G is in joy, and I'm like, that's a J, <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> okay. Somebody's Anything? ready to go home. <laughs> uh, no. Anything else? Then I need a motion for, if I could have a motion for A through N, with the exception of G, Jesse. Yes, I move that we accept items A through M on the consent agenda, with the exception of item G. Thank you. In a second. I'll second. Louis, thank you very much. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. We'll move on to item G. Approve the ELA Instructional Materials Adoption Committee. Dr. Ryan? Yes, this is a requirement to uh, uh, have a board approved committee for uh, uh, our staff in uh, various capacities to uh, uh, select the uh, pre kindergarten instructional materials. And uh, so uh, this is a committee. This is the, all we're asking the board to consider uh, is the actual committee uh, for the work to get done. Uh, the recommendations for the board trustees to approve the selection committee for the upcoming pre kindergarten instructional materials adoption committee. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I move we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you, Becky. In a second, Mindy, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Com Yes, uh, the, the reason I just uh, pulled this item, I just want the record to reflect in the minutes to show that I will abstain and recuse myself from conversation as well as the vote. Thank you. Anything else? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of item G? Motion carries. All opposed, all accused. Thank you. Motion moves. Uh, motion is approved 6 0 with Jess, Jesse Rodriguez uh, recusing himself. And abstaining. Abstaining, I'm sorry. Move on to announcements. Announcement. Yes. So we have a North Texas Area Association of School Board meetings this week. Uh, it will be wonderful. We're going to have um, the Texas Health Education Chairman, Representative Dan Huberty. Presenting a perspective on education legislation in the 2021 session. And that's the 18th. That is um, November 18th at 6:30. Via Zoom. Via Zoom. Okay. Anything else, Becky? Um, so the State Board of Education is meeting on uh, this next week uh, or this week also 18th and 19th. Um, we were really fortunate that TASB caught the fact that there was not a trustee on the committee that was examining the renewal of the framework for school board development for trustees. And so thanks to TASB, we got um, several people 
um, involved in that, uh, especially Karen Freeman down at Northside ISD. Um, it was a pretty dramatic change to the framework, um, extensive overhaul and very prescriptive and um, stripped of much of the governance aspect of the role of a trustee. Um, focused very much on um, educational jargon, uh, inputs, outputs, um, very star focused, and also seemed to encourage uh, interference or intervention in more day-to-day -day operations and management rather than focusing on governance. And so uh, TASB uh, directors and um, legislative advisory committee trustees have been working um, uh, and just any uh, leadership TASB graduates, um, any trustee that was interested in providing input on the changes to the framework um, have been working over the last couple months and uh, it is on the agenda for the State Board of Education uh, on Thursday, and so a number of trustees have signed up to testify on that. Um, so we'll we'll see. Um, it, there were some pretty startling changes uh, that really would have taken away the autonomy of the school districts, stripping the independence out of ISD, and um, pretty much leaving trustees, 7,000 of them, at the uh, behest of whatever TEA was describing should be done across a thousand individual school districts instead of school district trustees being accountable to their voters and making decisions based on their communities. So I know that's kind of, you know, not something that was on a lot of radars, um, but uh, testimony will be heard and we'll, we'll see what happens. Trustees have been communicating significantly with State Board of Education members, and that we uh, we got a couple of new members. Yes, you did. Yeah, so we we also got some new uh, State Board members uh, as a result of the election. I know I'm so excited about Audrey. Um, so yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we'll see what happens after this this week. So, but. Tune in, it's available online to and, we'll, so, and um, some of our students are going down to Round Rock on Sunday. We have uh, um, the Heritage uh, High School Girls cross country team and the Grapevine High School Girls cross country team and the Grapevine High School Boys cross country team yep. are all headed to state. And so it's great. Hey, we're leaving Sunday. Yep, the race is Monday. Um, in the afternoon, so it kind of stinks. But is there uh, a send off, Becky? Do you know? We are trying to put a send off together. Being on a Sunday without uh, being in school is kind of complicating that just a little bit. But we're definitely planning signs. We're uh, getting in contact with um, our public safety officials to see if they can do something. Um, and then, of course, when they come back, too, I think there will be. Um, there should be great lots to celebrate. Too. Right. That's yeah, exciting. That is exciting. Exciting. Very much. Oh, Jesse's got something. Yes, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. I'd like. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, congratulate and extend my best wishes to Casey uh, on his win and wish him best uh, success or much success in in his term as a trustee on this board. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate it. Absolutely. No congratulations to Jorge. <laughs> I, I was like, so he doesn't Aww, want me to do well or what? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Like... No, I've already, I had already done it to Jorge. I, I had already done that with Jorge. Oh. He did call me, so. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I had called him. I had called him. Oh. Um. Before y'all leave, there's a document that every trustee needs to sign on the uh, election, so I could get your um, signatures before you leave. And also, we'll be reaching out to you. We need to start looking at dates. You know, our team of eight is normally, we've done it by now. Um, the state has allowed us to move that because of all the elections and COVID and everything else. 
but we do need to get that in because we have to announce our hours in April. So we do go back into the same track of May elections. And um, so we'll need to announce our hours and have that done before. So we'll be, Kim, we'll be seeing what dates and because we don't have reserve dates in January or February. So we need to start looking at a date we all can get together for our team of eight. Um, everything else stays the same. Um, Christmas parade. Anything going on with that? So, yes, um, we are in uh, in the planning stages with the Chamber of Commerce uh, for Grapevine and uh, the City of Grapevine for uh, the annual um, Christmas parade. It'll be a reverse parade um, where and, and normally we go from south to north down Main Street. This will be just exactly the opposite, starting on the north and, and uh, moving south, except for um, the floats and the People that are in the parade will be uh, parked on the side of Main Street, and the traffic will the people will drive through uh, to, to see all the different uh, types of things that are that are there, uh, including uh, elected officials. And so, um, uh, Kim uh, will reach out to you about uh, your availability that evening, and and um, uh, we're what time is it? The third, yeah. Right. And so we're trying to do it in a safe way for the Christmas capital of Texas. And uh, so uh, um, we will have students involved, but they'll be stationary um, and it won't be nearly as many. And it'll be uh, our high school, high school kids that can be there for, for a little while. So we're trying to do it in a safe way. Also, uh, the traffic and the buses and that kind of thing is also a, a piece of the safety that we can no longer do. So. Um, uh, there's a lot of logistics to work out, uh, but we are committed, as is uh, uh, the City Grapevine and the Chamber of Commerce, to make sure that uh, something great happens for our community, even in the middle of the pandemic. In the middle of it. Thank you very much. Any other announcements or any, anything to say? Nope. I need a uh, motion to adjourn. Jesse? Uh, <laughs> One more time, Jesse. We think this was, really is. I was just going to say, after 18 and a half years, uh, this is my last item of or action item, I should say. So I would like to move that this meeting be adjourned. Oh, and a second. And I'll second. Louis, second. All those in favor? Motion carries eight zero seven zero. <laughs> Dr. Ryan didn't vote. <laughs> you know, Jesse, stranger things have happened. <laughs> This really could not be your last time to adjourn. You never know what December holds. That's right. <laughs> That's it. It's 2020. Yeah. Uh, meeting is adjourned at 1024. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, Jesse. We'll see you in December. <laughs>